most drinking club that it associates my dear audience. Wherever you're from, I hope you will. My name is Raleo. I send content analysis of the leader associates and your host of today's webinar. Welcome to Impact Webinar Energy Transition Red Lines in ASEAN. The ASEAN region is at the crossroad when it comes to the energy supply and the global climate change. With the rapidly growing population and increasing economic development, ASEAN countries need to guarantee transform their energy markets to ensure a sustainable and sufficient supply of the energy while also reducing their carbon footprint. The webinar will be covered key of the respect to policy, regulatory, frameworks, finance, investment, and development to help the facilitate the seamless transition towards a sustainable energy future. The webinar was held in the connection with the ASEAN Clean Energy Week. The event has been held in Philippines for the seven years. ASEAN Clean Energy Week 2023 will be started at 21 to 22 in November. The venue is in the SMX era in Manila. We bring together over 5,000 more C suits and professionals, leaders, and decision makers. We are excited to explore how we can accelerate the energy transition in this dynamic region. This is the home to the sum of the world's fastest growing economic. This is the perfect opportunity to share the insights and exchange ideas to the key area, including the solar energy, wind energy, and energy storage. So, um, it's my pleasure to introduce our the first keynote speaker for today, the Mr. Adam. He is the lead constant for the ASEAN Clean Energy Transition Outlook at the International Renewable Energy Agency. This is in this speech, Mr. Adam will be sharing the insights from the recently released ASEAN Clean Energy Transition Outlook report and highlight the key challenges and opportunities in the region. Without further ado, I would like to welcome the Mr. Adam to on the stage. Okay, good. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, Thank, Thank you. you very much for the introductions. Let me share my screen. Yeah. yeah we can we can see your screen. Yeah. Okay. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Adam Mari Vinata. I'm the consultant for the ASEAN Energy Transition Outlook, working with the Arena Innovation and Technology Center in Bonn. And I'm joining this webinar from Jakarta, Indonesia. And I would like to thank the organizer for having me today as one of the key speakers um, in this very uh, delightful webinars. Um, Arena has been uh, very actively encouraging the energy transition um, globally to encourage the emission reductions to 2050 and reaching the global climate target of one and a half degrees C's by mid centuries. And our World Energy Transition Outlook published in 2022 um, give the ARENA's perspective that the decarbonizations towards the mid centuries are going to be dominated by the implementation of renewables, energy efficiencies, electrifications and hydrogens with the increasing uh, role of the carbon capture and storage technology to help this uh, effort of the reaching net zero by mid centuries. IRENA has been actively uh, supporting the ASEAN regions in recent years, particularly in the development of the renewable energy outlook for ASEANs that were published um, September last year. This activity was supported by the ASEAN member states, the ASEAN Center for Energies, and the ASEAN Secretariat under the ASEAN IRENA MOUs, and funded by the voluntary contribution of uh, Denmark. In which, in these studies, we lay out the energy transition scenarios for the regions that covers the entire energy system of the 10 ASEAN member states that also include the multinodal regional power sectors uh, analysis that examine the regional power interconnections, grid expansions, and power flexibility within the regions. On the country level, we also supported the development of Indonesia Energy Transition Outlook 
supported by the Ministry of Energy and Mineral Resources of Indonesia, as well as the Malaysia Energy Transition Outlook that was supported by the Ministry of Natural Resources, Environment and Climate Change of Malaysia. These two studies um, includes the energy uh, layout, the energy transition scenarios for both countries with the in-depth analysis on the demand sectors, as well as the multinodal power sectors for um, power flexibility assessment within the countries and the impact for these uh, two countries within the ASEAN regions. To put some context into the ASEAN region itself, that the ASEAN region will see the rapid economic in, and population growth uh, until 2050 that will result in the increasing of, of two, about two and a half fold of the region's energy demand by mid centuries. And if the region still continues the current trend of uh, being highly dependent on the fossil fuel, the regions it is at risk of the volatility of price and the depleting resources of the fossil fuel in the regions. The good news is that with the new push of the global level to reach net zero emission by mid centuries has encouraged uh, several countries in the regions to pledge to reach net zero between 2050 to 2060s. This is supported with the fact that the renewable energy cost has been declining further and reaching the historic lows in terms of cost uh, globally. And this will, of course, benefit the region to uh, encourage the region to transition towards renewable as soon as possible. Um, our ASEAN renewable outlooks um, projects that under the business as usual, under the current policies that were implemented by the ASEAN countries, the energy related CO2 emissions will grow double towards the mid centuries, reaching the emission of about 2.8 gigatons annually. But under our most um, under our decarbonizing scenarios, the most aggressive decarbonizing scenarios, the one and a half degree C target scenarios, the energy related um, CO2 emissions can be reduced by 75% compared to the planned energy scenarios under the current policies with the remaining emissions coming from the hard to decarbonize sectors uh, such as industries and transport sector. The renewables is going to be the key uh, in reducing the er energy related CO2 emissions, accounting for about half of the total emission reductions with another one fifth coming from the direct electrifications and a quarter coming from the increased energy efficiencies on the demand sector. The big push toward electrifications, renewables, and energy efficiencies in our one and a half degree C scenarios will allow the regions to reduce their demand total final energy consumptions by 2050 of about one fifth compared to the planned energy scenarios. The electricity uh, is going to be the dominant carrier uh, comprising of about one of the total final energy consumptions in the regions compared to only uh, below 20% today. We are going to see also the increased role of hydrogens and renewable direct use, hydrogens uh, particularly in the industry sectors and for international bunkering, with a, a little bit of fossil fuels are still going to be consumed uh, in the hard to decarbonize sector by 2050, even under the one and a half degree C scenario. The total regions direct electricity consumptions under the one and a half degree C scenarios is set to increase, set to grow doubles by 2030 and grows even uh, reaching five times of the 2018 values by mid centuries. But regardless of the scenarios that uh, Irina produced, the renewables are going to be the backbone of the power sectors in the regions. This highlights that the expanding of the clean electricity generations 
is needed to be involved with the investment in the system flexibility that is really crucial to enable the transition within the regions. Several actions need to be taken to enable this uh, power sector transitions. For example, the accelerations, uh, the development of the integrated planning to meet the expanding electricity demand by means of generations capacity, grid infrastructure, um, storage and decentralized systems. Financing of the feasibility studies for the development of renewable based generation portfolio and the transmission project is need to be uh, accelerated. Um, followed with the, the risking and adjusted contract models to reduce the cost of capital and promote investment. These ultimately will need to be encapsulated under the uh, regulations that uh, ensure that there is a harmony between the price uh, regulation within the regions to prevent the unfair competition um, among the countries, the, among the ASEAN countries. The transmission expansions is going to be the crucial thing to tap the res renewable resources across the ASEAN and bringing this renewable electricity to, to the load centers. The significant level of growth in renewable electricity is under one and a half degree C's will require the flexibility of the power system, particularly transmissions and storage assets. This highlights that the transmission planning should really start as soon as possible, given the nature of the planning to commissioning of this transmission uh, line uh, within the countries, also within the regions, uh, usually takes, uh, takes time to, to implement. And in the end, the full potential of uh, renewables will require open markets and the alignment of regulation between the national transmission system operators um, among the countries within the regions. On the transport sectors, um, the ASEAN region, Southeast Asia regions will see that um, almost 80% of the total passenger road transport are going to run uh, on the electricities by mid centuries with the growth of about 100 million of EV cars and almost 300 million of electric two and three wheelers under the one half degree C's that increased the sec ele sector's electricity consumptions by about 30% uh, of the total transport um, final energy consumptions by uh, mid centuries. The biofuel role is going to increase, especially in the heavy duty transport that will, that will reach to about a quarter of the total transport sector uh, final energy consumptions by 2050 coming from the bioenergies. The transport sector transformations uh, is crucial to allow the emission reductions in the transport sector reaching 60% below the planned energy scenarios by 2050. Several action plans uh, is needed to enable these transformations of the transport sector within the regions, namely the development of the infrastructure of charging points for the electric vehicles that is equipped with the charging smart charging solutions and the sanitary frameworks that works both locally and also regionally. The programs of uh, promoting public and private electric vehicles and implementation of sustainable mobilities, as well as the promotions and the development of biofuel roadmap is uh, also really crucial to increase the use of biofuel and to some extent hydrogen in the Southeast Asia transport sector transformations. There are wide range of measures needed for allowing the energy transitions to happen in the regions, but the renewable energy is going to be very crucial driver in allowing the regions to reach the net zero by about mid centuries or 20, uh, sooner. The investment must start to mobilize towards the power sectors transformations, as well as to the acceleration of the energy efficiencies implementation and the electrification of the end use sectors. 
the the ASEAN renewable energy outlooks um, highlight that the transitions towards the one half degree C scenarios is considered the most economically feasible um, future to to go to for the ASEAN uh, Southeast Asia regions. Um, as this is going to be the most climate friendly pathway for the regions. The one and a half degree C's are going to save the regions of about 228.1 trillion or, or about 0.16 lower of the energy cost, total energy cost, if we are still going to go to the future under the planned energy scenarios. This is also um, encouraged with there is additional reduced external externality costs associated with the health and the climate change uh, avoided costs if we are to go to one half degree C's reaching between 16 billion to 49 billion annually or about half to one and a half trillion um, avoided externality costs if we are to go in half degrees scenarios compared to the business as usual scenarios. And in the end, uh, the energy transition is needed to be done in within the countries, not only because this is going to be to reduce the cost, but is also improving the energy security of the regions. It increased the economic development and job creations and it's also uh, helped to increase the health and the social welfare of the citizens that live in the regions. I think this was uh, my last slide. I would encourage you to go to our website to download our three um, studies that were published on the ASEAN uh, region studies. And please feel free to contact um, me or my colleague if you have any questions or you would like some further discussions. Thank you very much. Hello, Ms. Nadam. Hello. Ah, yeah, what's up from this page? So could you uh, answer some question from the audience? Yes, please. Uh, yeah. So uh, do you have some the good examples of the, the red lines in the ASEAN? I I'm mean, uh, yeah, yeah. Just what, what are good examples of the red lines in ASEAN? Like uh, in the ASEAN country, do you have some the good examples? to the tra transition, energy transition like that? The regulations? Uh, I mean, the good examples. The good examples, okay. Yeah, I mean, yes. um, for example, th th there are already several countries that, that they have uh, pledged to, to reach net zero by mid-centuries. Um, Indonesia also, for example, because we we done the, energy transition outlooks for the countries, Indonesia and Malaysia, they are pledged that they are going to uh, reach net zero by 2050s. Um, they have now um, set some targets, the more aggressive targets in increasing the renewables uh, penetrations in their final energy consumption and in their uh, energy mix by uh, 2035 in the, in the short terms, in the long terms, Vietnam has been uh, successfully in implement the renewable implementations in their capacity, uh, electric, electricity capacity, right? So there is, there is a lot of uh, good news within the countries that they, they have been encouraging with all of these challenges that, that still follows, but the, we, we see that the spirit is there and the implementation is there. Like we, we see the, the clear uh, efforts, regardless the challenges that, that is uh, still uh, a lot 
within the regions for the countries to implement. But we we need to be um, confident that more and more countries can learn from each other within the regions that we can see from from Vietnam, for example. Indonesia also has has been um, setting up regulations that promote and increase the target of renewables. We can work, we should work together between the countries, among the countries that this energy transitions is not only a job of one country, but we are talking about regions here. We need to go hand in hand and learn from each other to ensure that no countries is left behind. Okay, thank you. Thank you again, Mr. Mm -hmm. Dan. Thank you for your speech. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Uh, this is my Thank you. Uh, this is my pleasure to introduce our the second speaker for today. It's Honorable Dr. Sataya. He's the member of the National Energy Council of the Indonesia and will respect the figure in the field of the energy policy and planning. Today, Dr. Sataya will be sharing his insights on Indonesia path to clean energy leadership in ASEAN. As we all know, Indonesia is one of the largest energy producers and consumers in the energy and energy east of Asia region. And its transition to cleaner energy sources is secure to achieving a simple future. Now let's welcome Honorable Dr. Sataya to the stage. Uh, well, Hello, Dr. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ron, for your kind introduction. So my name is Satya. I'm not Sataya, but Satya. Just call me Satya for sure. Yes. <clears throat> yeah. And uh, I like to share my slide if it's possible. So let me um, yes. check first. Yeah. Okay. Just give me a moment and okay. Right. Sorry, this is uh, I'm I'm sharing it, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. You can you can put it for the, to the full screen. It's that is perfect. Yeah. Oh, hold on. Right. Okay. <clears throat> well, yeah. Today I would like to uh, share to the audience uh, virtually, you know, regarding the Indonesia switch to clean energy way trends and also best practices because a lot of um, you know, happening now in uh, in in our policy as well as on the implementations, and I'm also later on going to show to the audience about the best practices that uh, Indonesia has at the moment. If you come back to uh, you know the idea of Indonesia being uh, a country who signed the uh, uh, you know agreement and Paris Agreement back in 2015, and, uh, and now this. We develop the nationally determined contributions. Even uh, we update it, yeah, uh, you know, based on the result of the Glasgow uh, meeting. It was in 2021, so we call it that we uh, updated our NDC. And at the beginning, <clears throat> we uh, targeted 29% uh, of the reductions emission by 2030, and now we improve it up to 31.89%. This is unconditionals. If it's conditionals, uh, we improve from 39 something become 43.2%. So quite uh, uh, progressive in terms of, uh, you know, we are setting up the goals, you know, in order to achieve the reduction emission from, from the energy sectors that I, I'm, I'm talking here is basically uh, combinations from the energy sector with uh, industry, agriculture, also forestry and uh, other uh, land use. Yeah. <clears throat> and here uh, the development what uh, we are currently doing because of you know the NDCs has been set. Even we all also agreed to uh, set the target at net zero emissions by 2060. So the existing national energy policy need to be revisited, and now we are in the middle of revising it. So the goal is, of course, to achieve decarbonizations uh, energy system uh, and affordable energy price, and also to fulfill rationales, national energy demand in order to reach 
the Human Development Index target and become developed country by uh, 2045. So we have a scenario to be able to uh, quit from the middle income trap by 2043. And also to achieve the low carbon uh, energy system in order to support the common commitments, of course, back in, uh, like what I mentioned earlier, you know, by setting up the net zero emission by 2060. So a lot of things that need to be, uh, you know, done, you know, particularly, you have to be able to control the population growth to minimize the energy consumption in the long run. Yeah. And so, sorry, Dr. Sataya. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, but as the, all the audience said, uh, we only can see you through the slides, but oh. we, we can't see your PowerPoint, sorry. Oh, you cannot see the PowerPoint? Yeah, okay. we, we only can see you the first the slides, so could you um, try again? Okay, okay, I, I stop I stopped sharing, yeah? And I, uh, okay. I, I, okay, let me share again. How about this? Can you see it? Uh, could you move on the next one? We can try it. Right, okay. Here, can you see it? No? Uh, I think, no, maybe. No? Wow. Yes. What's happened? Because I'm sharing it and I, I saw it here. Um, excuse me, but maybe you should click the enable editing part over there on the oh, top. Yeah. Okay, hold on, yeah, hold on. Hold on, yeah, yeah. All right, okay. okay. Now it can progress. Hopefully it works, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, sorry for that. Okay. Yeah, we can show you all the slides. All right, okay, good, good. Okay, all right. thank you. Oh, sorry, this is the, the wrong slide, so hold on. This is the wrong slide. Yeah. How about this one? Can you see it? No? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can, yeah. we can see, yeah. Okay, it works, yeah. Well, let me slide show. All right. Okay. <clears throat> okay, this is the factors that uh, uh, that we are now uh, reviewing about the revision of the national energy policy. One is controlling the population growth to minimize the energy consumption in the long run, and then lowering the energy intensity. Yeah, and also the third is meeting the energy needs to achieve the high human development index and high economic growth, apart from the middle income trap in 2045. And then for the conserving the energy and the demand side, building a lifestyle culture with smaller, more efficient use of space and use of public transportation and low carbon vehicle for transportations. Five, carrying out the energy efficiency on the demand side and the supply side. Six is maximizing the transfer of fossil final energy use to electric energy electrifications and seven is quite important is deploying the energy technology with low energy intensity and emissions ton oil equivalent per us dollars and also a ton co2 per ton oil equivalents and eight optimizing the utilization of domestic energy resources to minimize import and nine is diversifying energy sources and um, the last one is uh, optimizing energy provision in terms of cost and carbon emission those uh, you know elements as now we are uh, developing in order to meet uh, the target of the net zero emission by 2060 so indonesia will have later on yeah, because, because now it's still under the discussion the new energy uh, policy will be in place uh, hopefully uh, by the end of uh, of this years <clears throat> Hold on. Okay, this is the the slide that uh, you know give an uh, idea about what Indonesia's strategy for the low carbon energy transitions. Basically, you know the the main point here that we don't get rid of fossil, but we decarbonize fossil. So fossil fuel is still there. 
but that with the application of the clean technology included the carbon capture storage, carbon capture utilization storage, and also net carbon sinks. Of course, we accelerate uh, the development of the new and renewable energy, such as the electric vehicle on the transportation, battery, hydrogen, and also implementation of the smart grid and smart energy. And also, like I mentioned earlier about the efficiency, energy efficiency, or energy conservation here. All of those strategies basically you know, for us to achieve the energy security, energy independence, sustainable development, also low carbon development and climate resilience. The reason why that we are emphasizing about the carbonizing of fossils, because we don't want to repeat the mistakes that been happen, at least, you know, the crisis happened in the UK, in the UK lately and also in China as well, and also in uh, uh, India. You know, because of uh, they're trying to you know move faster to you know from fossil to renewable energy, but you know because of the renewable is not uh, ready yet, you know, particularly dealing with the intermittencies, and they still need base loads, and then uh, you know they they found that it's not really works well. You know, unless we are really really ready to smoothen the transition from fossil to clean, uh, sorry to, to to renewable. So Indonesia uh, here is careful enough to to see the potency of the potency of uh, our uh, fossil fuel uh, resources and we are trying to maximize and of course we are using gas as a bridge you know for transition from uh, fossil to, uh, to 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 renewables energy and this is a macro assumption that i'm going to uh, you know to talk sorry uh, you know with with the audience here that I'm sorry that uh, Indonesia aiming yeah, to uh, set the target to quit from the middle income threat by 2043, of course, with the assumption of the uh, economic growth around 6%. So on our uh, modeling systems, you know, when uh, we are re revising the uh, uh, national energy uh, policy, like I mentioned earlier, so we use the assumptions for the low scenario with the economic growth around 5.2%. And uh, the, uh, the the high scenario is using a number is around 5.9%. As well as the population growth, yeah, with the average of the population growth is, you know, around 0.51%, uh, you know, starting from 2022 up to 2060. Yeah. So with those assumptions, we are, uh, you know, targeting that uh, we are able to, uh, you know, to uh, quit from the middle income trap by 2043. You know, then, um, you know, in our assumption as well, that Indonesia assume in 2060 that we are part of the developed country. So all the uh, the benchmark that we do, uh, you know, for final energy consumption, for instance, yeah, in uh, yeah, S1 is a low scenario, S2 is high scenario, is around 0 0.1, 0.5 for high scenario for ton oil we have on capita. But if we, if we do benchmarks by 2020, I think the OECD is around 2.62 and the world is 1.32. So we're still uh, above of the uh, you know the, the world uh, average from the final energy consumptions. For the electricity consumptions from you know kilowatt hours per capita is around uh, 6,500 for the high scenario. So while the OECD 2020 is around 7,085 of the kilowatt hour per capita. And also the primary energy supply uh, with a high scenario is around three ton oil equivalent per capita. Well, in the world's uh, average by 2020 is around 1.7. On Japan, if you're referring to Japan, it's around 3.2 uh, ton oil equivalent per capita. So that's the way we, uh, you know, we, we benchmark our futures uh, projections with the current, uh, you know, projections done by uh, uh, the, the developed countries. So here, the project of the final energy consumption, if you look at, you know, from the uh, high scenario and also the, you know, like S2 is the high scenario and S1 is the low scenario. Here, it's, it shows that, uh, you know, that the fossil fuel is still there. Uh, but again, the implementations of the fossil fuels with the uh, technology. And uh, if you look at the final energy consumption growth is around 2.82% up to 3.8% per year in average. And final energy consumption profile, if you look at from 2060, 
Yeah, industrial is around 55% and transport at 34%. Household 8% and commercial is 3%. With this uh, you know, number, it shows that um, you know, we have to be able to con concentrate on the industry sector as well as transport sectors if we want to achieve the net zero emission by 2060. We have to do something on the industry side as well as on the uh, transportation side. And here, as you uh, see, the coal, we still utilize coal and also the natural gas and biomass. But again, we are using the clean technology like a CCS and CCUS in the industrial and generation sectors, you know, starting in 2051. So the hydrogen also is used for the industry and transportation starting from 2031. So hydrogen mentioned in this model is blue hydrogen sourcing from natural gas and also from coal, we call it uh, gray hydrogen. Of course, with the CCS and CCUS, as well as the green hydrogen from the renewables uh, energy. <clears throat> so hold on for the next slide. Uh, here, uh, mentioning about the projection of the final energy demands. If, uh, if you look at the energy growth for the industry, yeah, continues to increase by average for 3.6% to 3.9% per year. But the energy growth for the transportation and household and commercial is uh, slowing down you know, by the end of 2060. It means that we are already converting you know, from the energy consumptions become more uh, to, to become more the electrifications. So we electrify our uh, transportation as well as household and also commercials. So that's where the growth is um, you know, uh, slowing down compared with the use of the energy at the industry sectors. So electrification in the energy users, transportation industry, household and commercial is one of the main program to support the energy transition. In total, the share of the electricity consumption reached 35.3% uh, to 37.8% in 2060, with average growth is around 4.89% to 5.35%. The use of the new and renewable energy for transportation, such as hydrogen, biofuels, and industry like biomass, biofuels still continue uh, to increase. Now here from demand side, yeah, if you look at the demand supply electricity projections, so the consumption in 2060 reached around 1,830 until 2,173 terawatt hours, which is dominated by the industry and transport sectors, like what I mentioned earlier to you. So we concentrated on two, two sectors, yeah, industry and transportation. So electricity per capita rates around 5,539 up to 6,577 kilowatt hour per capita. And in 2060, most of the electricity demand will be supplied by renewable uh, energy based plants at around 38, uh, 384 gigawatt until 460 gigawatt. And nuclear power plants in place you know, with the capacity is around 45 gigawatt up to 54 gigawatt. And with total, if you combine between the renewables and as well as the new, uh, with total capacities around 522 gigawatt and 625 gigawatts by uh, 2060. So here, the total primary energy mix, if you look at, uh, you know, from number, if scenario one with, with the, uh, the, the pessimist, uh, you know, scenario, the optimist scenario, scenario two, so the, uh, you know, the, uh, the compositions between renewable energy and non-renewable energy around 63% up to, and and uh, and uh, compared with uh, non-renewables around uh, 37%, so as 62% with 38, uh, 38%. So if I like to break down the share of the new and renewable energy sources in the mix, is solar around 21% up to 23%, hydro 10 to 11, nuclear. 9 to 10 percent, biomass 8 percent, uh, also, uh, you know, uh, the uh, biomass as well, uh, geothermal is 4 percent, wind 1 to until 2 percent, and other new and renewable energy like ocean currents, ocean thermal, sea wave, and sea tides. So you can see here that the solar will have a big portion uh, on the renewables energy mix. Coal and natural gas also decreasing trend up to 2060, yeah, the utilization of coal natural gas is aimed to meet the needs of the manufacturing and generation industry with the use of CCS and CCUS. So we don't use coal basically for power plant, but we use coal for yeah, the industry. 
oil share is also projected to be the least energy supply in the futures because we are suffering with the uh, oil at the moment because we are importing country. So if we are able to reduce the oils, it means that we uh, uh, encourage, uh, you know, for other spending that is, we are not, uh, you know, suffering with the deficit, uh, you know, the revenues. It is projected uh, to hold like 5% share in primary energy mix to the remaining, you know, assuming that uh, in the in internal combustion engine vehicle still in operation. You'll hear the, the gas yeah, from the gas side because we are considered that gas as a bridge for the energy transitions, uh, you know, at least on the middle terms and 2020 up to 2035. If you look at here that uh, the gas productions, uh, we are aiming to produce around 12 PCF per day in 2030. Yeah, and uh, of course, declining in 2040 is around 9.3 BCF. And export dedicated uh, half of it is around 6.9 uh, BCF, while you know, we, we use uh, the rest of it for uh, domestic consumption. So here on the transportation sectors, we uh, assume that we also promoting the uh, uh, natural gas vehicles. So we optimize the use the natural gas vehicles. So gas price has also uh, been uh, you know, taken into account, the economic of the gas field and the availability of the gas infrastructure. So we optimize our uh, you know, gas for preparing to uh, you know, do, do the transition from fossil to renewables energy. Here, the, uh, the best practices that I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, that Indonesia, uh, you know, doing what so-called the conversion of fuel oil to the com compressed natural gas for fishermen, and we targeted in 2022, if you look at the conversion of fuel oil to gas fuel for fishermen, as many as uh, 30,000 packages distributed in 17 provinces or 51 districts or cities. And also we do uh, similarly for the, uh, for the, hold on, for the farmers, yeah. For the farmers, we, we also convert from fuel oil to uh, CNG, as many as 30,000 packets distributed in 16 provinces or 50 districts and cities. So as you, you can see from my slide, if you like to see in details, you know, what city, what, uh, you know, district that are receiving the distribution of uh, the conversion of fuel oil to CNG for, for farmers. So at least uh, we, we started already and uh, also we do, the program was so-called the de desalization for emission reduction in power generations energy mix. If you look at the PLN, uh, yeah, PLN diesel power plants, uh, consists of around uh, 5,200 of, uh, you know, diesel power plant, you know, units, yeah. And we scattered, uh, scattered over 2,130 locations. So if you convert uh, fuel consumption uh, with that uh, number in 2020, 20, uh, fuel consumption around 2.7 uh, million kiloliter and a fuel cost around 16 trillion rupiah. Yeah, 16 trillion is around uh, 1 billion probably yeah, US dollars, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And also we are uh, uh, you know, converting from diesel to new renewable energies around 499 megawatt. Yeah, so diesel conversion to solar power and also to uh, you know battery system and hybrid diesel engines. For the first one, the diesel conversion is around 212 megawatts in 183 locations and using the hybrid scheme, solar and battery, and also the existing diesel. The phase two, we are aiming to uh, convert around 287 megawatt uh, using available of the new and renewable energy, and uh, which is uh, you know nearby, and uh, the benefit of it is that the fuel consumption reduced around sixty-seven thousand kiloliters, and CO two emission reduction around 0.3 million ton, and energy mix improvements around uh, 15, 0 0.15 percent. So diesel to gas is around uh, three hundred four megawatt. Diesel conversion to gas power plant, a gas engine, uh, you know what we call the gasification of diesel, and also diesel to grids around 1,070 megawatt. The so diesel conversion from isolated system to grid interconnected. 
So those are uh, the best practice, at least, that I can show to, uh, to the audience here. Another best practice is about the energy conservation program. So we are uh, also uh, you know, thinking about the standardizations. Yeah. So application of the minimum energy performance standard and affixing energy saving levels. And second is implementation of the energy management uh, using the Indonesian standard uh, nationals and ISO 5001, sorry, uh, 50,001 in energy management with the energy saving around 18.9 uh, you know, terawatt hours and emission reduction around 11.4 million tons of CO2. So if we are able to do such thing, that's quite the uh, you know, numbers you know, to reduce the emission. Another uh, you know, idea is application to energy saving technology and effort to use the electric vehicles. Of course, electric vehicle become a key you know, for the future development in the energy uh, in the transportation sectors. And also development of the energy conservation business, awareness and awards, dissemination and awarding of companies, industry, implementing energy conservations. Those are the, the way we uh, you know, uh, implement the energy uh, conservation or energy efficiencies. Uh, this is a projected utilization of hydrogen. Yeah, if you look at uh, Indonesia, even though hydrogen is in the and at, at the moment is uh, very much on the research stage. Yeah, it's not been commercially uh, implemented, but at least we have uh, we are targeting that uh, the hydrogen for the industry is around 11.6 million ton oil equivalent by 2060, and also hydrogen for transportation around 17.2 million ton. Uh, oil equivalents. So that's uh, 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 our models, you know, for to be blue hydrogen due to current economic consideration, because blue hydrogen is cheaper than uh, green hydrogen at the moment. So to be uh, frank, that uh, we are developing for the green hydrogen, but again, in the midterms, that we are thinking about the uh, blue hydrogen with the basis of natural gas. So we expected that the production cost, of course, the green hydrogen, you know, by the time will decrease significantly and able to compete with the, with, with the blue hydrogens. So this is a best practices of the hydrogen development in Indonesia. Like I mentioned earlier that hydrogen development is still at the research and pilot project states. And, and we do some cooperation with other countries like uh, our state-owned enterprise Pertamina and GIZ cooperate in developing green hydrogens uh, pilot project from geothermals. This is a uh, uh, it's a good uh, move. And also the, our research center, the National Research Center and Toshiba cooperation in Japan is also doing the same thing on the development of the green hydrogens. So this is, uh, if you look at the utilization of the hydrogen in Indonesia starting from 2007, even though, you know, again, this is very much on, on the research states rather than on the commercial states at the moment. And this is a green uh, hydrogen as alternative fuel. So in the futures, you know, if you, I like mentioned earlier, hopefully by 2060, the green hydrogen is com more competitive compared with, uh, with, with, with the blue hydrogens. This is also hydrogen for power generations. Yeah. So we are uh, you know, doing some uh, research with Mitsubishi Heavy Industry and developing for uh, hydrogen for power generations. For the large uh, capacity turbines, you know, diffusion type of with uh, hydrogen density 100%, pre-make type with uh, you know hydrogen density 30%. Co-firing trials have been completed in 2018, and also uh, another type like multi-cluster type with 100% high uh, hydrogen density is uh, you know still under development. So I think the Mitsubishi heavy industry through Mitsubishi Powers developed three types hydrogen combustion engine to small and medium capacity turbine. So that those are the, our uh, our step yeah, for uh, moving from uh, <clears throat> you know, fossil fuel for power generation to the uh, uh, more cleaner. In the plants of the uh, uh, renewable energy power plants, you know, we call it the RUPTL is more on the uh, electricity power plants. It's not only renewable as a whole, but uh, I just want to show you here that our commitment to put in our uh, electricity power plants uh, 2021 and until 2023. 
So the PLN, the our state-owned electricity company, support the private sector's uh, participation in the development of electricity infrastructure, where 64.8 percent of power plant portion is planned to be developed by uh, by private sec private sector, and 56.3 percent of new and renewable energy power plants plan to be developed by the private sector. So there is a hope for uh, the private sector to chip in, yeah, to um, you know, to participate in the. RUPTL uh, 2021 uh, until 2030. And uh, probably uh, last slide, if I, I'm not, uh, okay, that is going to my last slide. I think those are, uh, you know, scenario that we do and also some best practices. So at least the audience will aware that Indonesia is moving forward uh, to achieve our net zero emission by 2060 with uh, that kind of uh, scenario. Hopefully that uh, it will give an idea for the audience to know the uh, progress of Indonesia toward the net zero emission by 2060. And by saying that, I conclude my presentation. Thank you very much. Hi, Dr. Hi, Sethaya. Sethaya, could you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, thank you for your excellent and wonderful speech. And uh, uh, I also have the, we have the full question in our Q&A box. So could mm -hmm. you have you stay, stay there a moment to answer the, all the audience questions? No problem, no problem. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm honored to introduce uh, our next keynote speaker for today. The Mr. Wischu is the head of the Hydro and Renewable Energy Power Plant at the Elect Electricity Generating Authority of the Thailand and the ex expert in the field of the renewable energy, renewable energy with over two decades and experience in the energy industry. He has been at the forefront of the e-gates efforts to transition to cleaner energy sources. Welcome to Ms. Chu. Hello, Mr. Wishu. Could you hear me? Okay, I see you. I'm sorry. Okay. Oh, yeah. Can, can you hear so, me? Yeah, could you share your screen? Okay. Just a moment. Yeah, we can see you. Yeah. Do you do you see my slides? Uh yeah, but it's uh is this not full screen? Could you uh change it? Okay. Is that so? If you if you can't uh run it, so we can help you to um make the slides. Okay. Okay, okay. So we will we will make the slides for you. Yeah, just if you speak the next slides, we will we will to change the slides for you. Okay, okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good 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 afternoon everybody. I which would see Tom from Ikan. Ikan is a uh, that as a pie in Thailand, we, we have the policy to support the Thailand clean energy transition also. Next, next slide, please. We, we, Thailand, Thailand is facing the problem with the climate change also. So you can, it's a government company that we plan to pushing forward to Thailand, go to the clean energy and aim to reduce the carbon dioxide emission to nationality also. So we, we, we plan to, you can set the policy, the set, you can go to the achieve the carbon 
neutrality by 2050 or so. So we we have a we have the we aim to the achieve the carbon neutrality with the chipon as measures. The first is the source transformation. We would like to to share the the source of the the CO two emission to the renewable energy. We we have a we have the plan to to increase the renewable energy in Thailand. We start to increase the renewable share in the power mix with the, the main project of the hydro floating solar hybrid with the battery energy storage system with the 2,700 megawatt in year 2037. We plan to have a hydro floating solar in the Ikat Dam area. We have the 16 projects in the future to increase the, the portion of the renewable energy for the Ikat. It's maybe increase 20 percent for the for the power generator section of our company. So in the, in the act, just, just, just uh, we still, please, please go back to the, the, last, the last line, please. So we have the, also, it's not only the renewable energy, we have the, would like to put, make a grid modernization also. We would like to uh, like a increase the, the, uh, the portion. We can, uh, would like to develop innovation and support the increasing of the new remote energy with the, that we have the problem is that they have the fluctuation in the, in the system. So we would like to have a battery energy installed in the, our grid and develop the renewable our generation forecast system also to predict the, the our generation of the renewable to be have stable or reduce the fluctuation of the renewable power generation by the BESS system. So we would like to see the seeking of the modern technology and clean energy such as uh, hydrogen flow. We can plan to use the hydrogen to generate the electricity by 2044, with uh, maybe produce the 66 billion unit of the hydrogen flow by 2050. Okay, next slide please. Yeah, uh, the other thing is- Sorry, sorry, Mr. Excuse me. Yes. Yeah, could you, um, yeah, we, we can't hear you really clearly. Could you put the microphone close with you or you can speak a little bit louder? That's okay. perfect. Thank you. Thank you. The, the, the second, the second issue that we plan to, to make a, 
carbon neutrality in Thailand, in, in part of the ECAT, we would like to have the sink or co-creation. We would like to absorb and storing carbon is a key factor to reduce sink, the greenhouse gas emission. So we can has uh, initiated uh, the participation story for uh, 400,000 acre reforestation project with the, with the partner and plan to apply the carbon capture utility and storage CCUS by uh, by the, we will have the existing power plant and we have the ECAN memo by in the northern part of Thailand, we would like to plan to make a CCUS in that area. We can plan to store the carbon, maybe 3.5 to 7 million ton in years. 2045, and we we would like to provide the, the reforest and yeah, about 14,000 acres per year. After that, we plan to to have a tree to maintenance plan will be excused for the nine years to increase and the abundance of the forest area to create ecological balance and lead to the sustainable development. We would like to absorb 1.2 million tons of the CO2 per year or 24 million tons of the CO, CO2 for the, the whole duration of the project. Uh, for the CCUS, is a technology, is a carbon capture uh, oxide, uh, carbon dioxide emission from the power plant uh, or the heavy industrial such as uh, steel, cement, and power generation part. So we would like to make a pipeline or ship to store the carbon in the deep underground area in the northern part of the Thailand. Okay. Can, can you go to the next slide? We have the, the third measure. We would like to support measure mechanism. We would like to provide the, the education to the new generation people in the Thailand. We would like to support the project that provide to use the more efficiency of the, the energy to reduce the electricity demand and avoid the carbon dioxide emission from the electricity power generation sector. We have the, uh, we provide knowledge how to save the energy in the school. We have the, we have the uh, green classroom project in the 400 school in Thailand to make a new 
generation to have a knowledge for the energy saving, something like that. The next slide, please. This is uh, the project. Uh, this is a solar voting project that we can plan to have in, in the future now. Right now, we have the, the project in the Upon Latina Dam. We have the, we start the project this year. We will plan to finish the COD the project in within this year or the beginning of the next year. We have the 24 megawatt floating solar with the, the, the ASS 3 megawatt now to balancing or to the stabilize some power generation. Is that in the future, we have the 16 project in the big dam in the Ikat area. We, we have the, some, some the boat, some dam, some Ikat dam, we have the challenge because of the dam is a heaven. The level of water we have the, maybe deep, or the little deep, in the water. So it's, it's not so easy to implement that project. We, we have to study and we have to provide some technology to, to have the, the water that suitable for the deep water level in the, in the dam area. Maybe like a Umi Point Dam. We, we have the water level 100 meter. And we have the difference between the high level and low level, maybe more than 30 meter. That is a challenge us to, to make a new project. Okay, the next slide, please. We can we can help, we plan to help the, the pump solar hydro power can also. We would like to the, the big the, the SS system to support the renewable power can in each area. We plan to have the six location for the PSH power pan. The first, the full project is a, a solar pond dam area. We will have the, we have the existing dam and we would like to have the make a new reservoir for the pump storage power plant. In that area, we plan to have a 800 megawatt and 6.4 Sikawat now. We hope that we can see this project by 2024. The other, the other, I'm sorry, power plan is maybe in, in our plan, but it's not yet started. We plan to have the new six, I'm sorry, kind of power plan in the future. Okay, thank you for my presentation. This is my last slide, okay, thank you. Next slide, please. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Mr. Westrup. Yes. Yeah, thank you for your excellent moving speech about the Thailand and the gate. Um, I saw the still have some audience have questions. They will put the questions on the Q&A box. So could you stay a little bit and answer it? Mr. Wistrup? Yes. Yes, thank you so much. 
Uh, let me introduce our keynote speaker for today. The next one is the Mr. Ganesha. He's the Assistant Director of the Storage Planning Unit at the Sustainable Energy Development Authority in Malaysia, and the expert in the field of the energy renewable and with the over decade of the experience in the energy industry. He has been at the free front of the Malaysia's offered and transition to clean the energy sources. Let's move the stage to the Ms. Ganesha. Hi, Ms. Ganesha. Oh, hello. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Ryan. I'll just share my slide. Yes, that's great. Yep. Oh, are you able? Are you able to see my slides? Yes. All right. So. Yeah, uh, I'm Ganesha. I'm, I'm coming from Seda Malaysia Sustainable Energy Development Authority. We are in charge of developing renewable energy and energy efficiency in Malaysia. So uh, I'll be presenting on the Malaysia Renewable Energy Roadmap or the MIRA for short. So the pathways to low carbon energy systems, our objective is to determine the renewable energy targets in the electricity mix up to 2035 and to determine strategies required to achieve the renewable energy targets. So as you can see, this is the potential of renewable energy sources that we have in Malaysia. We have got solar radi irradiation throughout the whole year. We have agriculture and domestic industrial waste from bioenergy, which can be used for both combustion and also gasification, river basins for small hydroelectricity power. As you can see, uh, our solar has got the highest potential in terms of development, followed by bioenergy, sorry, followed by hydro, uh, large scale and also small scale, uh, bioenergy in terms of biogas and biomass, and also geothermal potential. And it's spread it throughout the whole country, uh, Peninsula Malaysia, Sa uh, Sarawak and also Sabah. And you can see the largest potential is with solar, uh, a total of 137 gigawatt in Peninsula, 32.1 gigawatt in Sarawak and also 99.4 gigawatt for Sabah, followed by uh, hydro potential for large and also small hydro and bioenergy sources. As you can see over here, we have our business as usual graph and also our new capacity target, which are looking to increase the renewable energy. Um, so the capacity mix by 2025 looks like 12, uh, 12,916 megawatt, which is about 31% of the uh, share. 31% capacity, where a large quantity of it is from solar, almost 24%, which is 4,706, uh, followed by large hydro, 5,862, small hydro, 1,153 megawatt, biomass, 862, and 333 megawatt of biogas. So uh, in terms of development, each one has got its own challenges, but we are overcoming them one at a time. And as you look right now, we, have, we are already at 25% installed capacity mix. And our projection for 2035 looks like this. We are looking at uh, 17,996 megawatt, by, uh, which is 40%. And 30% of it comes from solar, which is 7,280 megawatt, large hydro, 8,062 megawatt, biogas and biomass, 406 and 998 megawatt, uh, respectively. Small hydro, 1219 megawatt, and geothermal at 30 megawatt. Um, yep. Uh, so the strategic framework or the formula for us to hit our target would be as shown in terms of driving renewable energy growth. Our vision is to pave the way forward for low carbon energy systems. So our technology specific pillars include solar, bioenergy, hydro, and new solutions or resources post 2025. So in terms of solar, we're looking to accelerate rooftop PV deployment and roll out large scale solar to create new business models for our current existing uh, models. And also for bioenergy, we are looking at new business model to leverage bioenergy resources because naturally we have a lot of sunlight and a lot of crops. And in terms of hydro, we are planning to leverage the full hydro potential. Uh, we are getting out studies in terms of what potential we have in terms of river basins. And of course, post 2025, we're looking at other or alternative renewable energy sources to explore development and demonstration of new energy technology, which is available, proven, 
and enabling initiatives to carry out all these studies or all these initiatives would be to leverage future proving electricity market for a re opportunity, improving access to financing because we understand the large uh, capex involved in terms of renewable energy development, shaping human capital and infrastructure. One of the issues that we are facing is the lack of uh, skilled workers within the industry who has the knowledge in terms of renewable energy and sustainability. So reskilling or skilling the workers would be really important. And apart from that is increasing system flexibility, because as you, as you understand, the grid has been created for fossil fuels and we have to develop the national grid. And it has to be a little bit more flexible in order for us to take in more renewable energy sources. Uh, you can scan here for the full report, which is also shown in the last slide later on. So in terms of solar, the solar pillar, what we are looking at in terms of projection up to 2035, which is about 40%, is 18,000, sorry, install capacity of 18. And as you can see over here, that these are the few things that we are looking into is to accelerate the current net energy metering. Right now, we've got three main net energy metering mechanism. One is for the residential, the other one is for uh, commercial and industrial, and one more is for government buildings. And we're looking at developing new business model as an energy metering in Malaysia will be ending as of December this year, and to enhance the, our current LSS options. So to initiate put a future NEM program, including review of tariff and remove capacity limit, and VNM, initiate government rooftop tendering program, and enable corporate PPAs, via TPA framework, which is being uh, studied at the moment. Explore avenue distributed generation. Enhancement of a uh, platform for REC training, which is being developed. We recently had our launch of our carbon program under BERSA. Implement LSS auction with focus of area utilizing hydroelectric basin and water bodies. Uh, one of the options was, was to look into uh, floating solar as well. So NAM program by competitive retailers implementation of additional options as needed. So as you can see our existing model, we've got the net energy metering, which I explained earlier. We've got LSS, large scale solar, power purchase agreement. And apart from that, we have got CELCO, self-consumption. So the future would be to revise NAM rates, increase competition and auctions, decrease the strike in price. And prosumer and retailer using third-party rooftops, LSS asset owner to develop special purpose for company. And apart from that, in the future, we're looking at corporate PPA. Uh, right now we have uh, CGPP, Corporate Green Power Purchase Agreement, which is uh, a part of the virtual uh, energy trading, BPPA. And apart from that, we have already started our renewable energy certification. So out of this, BPPA is already done. Uh, REC is already available. Third party access is actually being studied. And for bioenergy, uh, we are going to use the RE fund for feeding tariff and come up with a new business model to accelerate the take up and co firing and bio CNG because we understand we can actually reduce the amount of fossil fuel which is being used in the industry. So, accelerate the administration of RE fund for biomass and biogas, auction NEM for remaining biogas and biomass potential, assessment of biomass clustering because we understand most of the biomass and biogas are in industrial areas which is far away from electricity connections so if you can cluster them you can actually get the electricity source to come in and you can actually get your energy sources from one spot implementation of options for wte waste to energy resources potential not outside of filling tariff explore feasibility of bio cng and co-firing so as i mentioned earlier the mixture of bio cng and also co-firing will actually reduce your amount of fossil fuel and increase the sustainable use of bioenergy. Apart from that, organize auctions outside of feed-in tariff for remaining biogas and biomass capacity within in identified clusters. Roll out the bio CNG and co-firing after the study has been carried out by 2035. And as you can see over here, these are the potential uh, sites that we have in terms of uh, bioenergy because we've got a lot of uh, palm oil factories catered throughout the whole of Malaysia. So one, one would be NEM for bioenergy, 
bio CNG and co-firing and bioenergy clustering. So the clustering will actually help in terms of interconnections. As for hydro, we are planning to carry out study in terms of site identification and auction using the RE fund for feed-in tariff system, large hydro development, uh, understanding the pool potential and seeing sites that we can develop large hydro, accelerate ad administration for RE fund and for small hydro, identify additional small hydro resources, explore feasibility for life extension and for the of the retailing hydrologic facilities, auction on resources potential for FIT and development of hydroelectric projects identified under PDP. So one of the things that hydro has in terms of issue or backlog is uh, the approval process. So we are looking at fastening the process through engagement via state uh, with the state government to facilitate uh, or accelerate the approval process. And we are carrying out the hydrological study to understand the potential of available areas for small hydro system and large hydro system. So uh, out of the long list of sites, so in terms of river basins, uh, we get to filter them and through the database of potential sites, we actually find which has got the potential for high head, uh, proper hydrology movement of uh, river and the closest distance to the grid because you don't spend too much of the interconnection. And second filter is in terms of LTOE assessment, uh, the most uh, profitable or economically friendly uh, project and environmental assessment, which doesn't disturb so much of the environment. So that's it for hydro. And in terms of new energy solutions and resources, RE generation, I um, mean new, new renewable energy sources, storage in, uh, and innovative technology. So engagement and exploration of new RE technology resources and solution from 2022 up to 2025 and coming up with studies in terms of feasibility and potential and pilot programs, assessment of energy storage solution, including green, green hydrogen and leading it to adoption post 2025. So post 2025, we are looking at feasibility study and deployment and enablers for new RE resources. And out of the potential that we are looking into is green hydrogen, hydrogen produced via renewable energy sources, as this the most cleanest hydrogen. And battery energy storage system. And we're also looking at pump hydro storage, which uses uh, hydroelectricity, which gets pumped back and then you supply it uh, once the water is back up. Either with it. So the energy used to supply the water back up is from renewable energy sources, most, of, most likely would be solar. And apart from that, we're also looking at uh, ocean thermal energy sources and uh, low wind speed. So enabling initiatives, future-proving electricity market for RE opportunity, implementing third-party access framework, retail market, REC market, and other measures to increase or accelerate the RE program, promote retail competition to support consumer choices. The more choices they have, the prices would come down and basically increase or accelerate adoption towards renewable energy sources, large-scale adoption of new business models, creating liquid and vibrant voluntary REC, including large hydro assets. Improving access to financing. As I mentioned earlier, one of the issues that we face in terms of uh, renewable energy development is the high capital costs. So implementing best practices of increased level of financial flows towards accelerating our redeployment in energy transition, enhancement of fiscal and non-fiscal incentives, leverage on funds of funds. As I mentioned this, uh, we are, our banks are also taking a lot of initiative to come up with a lot of sustainability financing, which is really good for renewable energy development at the moment. Apart from that, shaping human capital infrastructure, human capital development, develop a pool of skill because we understand it's a new uh, industry and we need more people to join uh, and inculcate our eccentric society. Uh, no matter how good the energy mix is, if you still waste, it doesn't make sense. So we need to develop societal changes in terms of developing a sustainability community. And apart from that, adoption to 4IR technology is the using of digitalization in terms of our transition. Apart from that, increase system flexibility, develop capacity market balancing, market framework for implementation, strengthening grid flexibility, increasing market integration, 
and multilateral power sharing framework through interconnections. One of the things that our local utility company, uh, Tanaga National Brahad, is looking into is international connections with uh, neighboring countries such as Singapore, uh, possibly looking into Thailand and also Indonesia as well later on. Uh, right now, uh, we already have LTMS, which is from Laos, Thailand, Malaysia, Singapore, uh, providing the hydropower from Laos to Singapore. So the key takeaways from the Malaysian Renewable Energy Roadmap, RD capacity is expected to increase uh, from current output to 12,916 megawatt by 2025 and 17,996 megawatt by 2035. Definitely is a positive outlook for RD growth in Malaysia. And with the increase of RD capacity, you definitely see the reduction of carbon emissions and which is, a, which is our target 45% by 2030 and 60% by 2035. And the enabling environmental and socioeconomic benefits includes but not limited to is community investment of 53 billion investment within the country, uh, Malaysian Ringgit, and job creation of 46,636 opportunities and carbon emission reduction of up to 60%. And this is not possible by only one agency, it has to be overall country commitment and collaboration of policymakers, industry players and strategic partners. This also includes neighboring countries for international connection. So international connection uh, removes the need of uh, having to spend in terms of battery storage, you actually share your renewable energy sources. Thank you. Uh, you can uh, take a scan of the full report over here. Uh, any question yes. and answers? Thanks, Ms. Ganesha. Thanks. Yeah, 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 still have some audience put the questions in the Q&A box. It's under the, the screaming there. So could you have answered the question and uh, let's be perfect. Yep, will do. Yeah, thank you so much. So uh, furthermore, the Philippine market is currently expensive and high level to demand. And especially in the light of the recent policy award to the new 11.600 megawatts renewables capacity scheduled for the auction in the June. This development serves to the underscore the sway vote and the expansion of the Philippines market and its increasing status as a key player in the renewable energy sector facing the Southeast Asia. This is my pleasure and honor to introduce our next keynote speaker for today is Dr. Rowena. She is the Undersecretary of the Philippines Department of the Energy and the expert in the field of the energy policies and planning. In her speech, Dr. Rowena will be discussed the opportunities that be equalization present for the Philippines renewable energy sector and the challenging that need to be overcome to achieve the successful transition. She will highlight in the policies that DOEs promote the growth of the renewable energy in the country. So I would like to welcome the Dr. Rowena to on the stage. My fellow speakers and panelists, participants from the yes. energy sector, representatives from the government and private agencies across the ASEAN region, pleasant day to all of you. I would like to thank the leader associates for inviting me to speak in today's web webinar with the theme energy transition readiness in ASEAN and present the Philippines renewable energy market liberalization, opportunities and challenges. First, let's talk about the power statistics in the Philippines. Coal contributes 44% of the installed capacity and 58% gross power generation in the Philippines. This is followed by renewable energy or RE with 29% of installed capacity and 22% of total gross power generation as of 2021. Among the REs, hydro provided the biggest share at 13% and geothermal at 10% for the installed capacity and gross generation. Based on recent studies by the World Bank and other development partners, the Philippines has a huge RE resource potential, but there is much work to be done. The Philippine Energy Plan 2020 to 2040 has a target of 35% RE share in the power generation mix by 2030 and 50% by 
by 2040. To realize these goals, we are institutionalizing a comprehensive approach to address the challenges and gaps that prevent or delay wider application of RE and RE technologies in a sustainable manner and outline the action plan necessary to facilitate and encourage greater private sector investments in art and development. In the next 17 years, we plan to have 5% energy savings on oil products and electricity, 10% electric vehicle penetration rate in road transport, the adoption of advanced and interoperable ICT in, in the energy chain, and resilient and climate-proof energy infrastructure. Currently, the total power demand in the country is about 26,000 megawatts. To meet this electricity demand and reach our targets, we need to build 52,826 megawatts of renewable energy on top of existing and committed power plants in the country. This will consist of 27,000 megawatt solar, 16,600 16, megawatts wind, 6,150 megawatts hydro, 2,500 megawatts geothermal, and 364 megawatts of biomass. Last year, the Department of Energy awarded a total of 1,002 projects with RE contracts with total potential capacity of 80,000. 339 megawatts. We also need to invest in research and development and demonstration to determine the viability of adapting certain RE systems, technologies, or processes in the Philippine setting, particularly in areas where there is zero or limited local experience. We need to get the output of renewable energy generators all the way to the consumers. We can do this by building a smart green transmission system that connects the RE sources to the main grid and allow unimpeded, unconstrained, and reliable power. Aside from traditional RE sources, we are continuously looking for new and emerging technologies such as ocean and tidal technology, offshore wind, and waste to energy technologies. The utilization of alternative fuels are also being studied such as hydrogen and ammonia, among others. We consider nuclear to be part of the energy mix from 2032 onwards and hope that the private sector will collaborate with us in pursuing this initiative. We see that this new generation investments will help us meet our energy supply requirements and decarbonization targets as well. The Department of Energy also pushed for 100% foreign ownership in RE project exploration, development and utilization of solar wind, hydropower, and ocean energy to facilitate and encourage greater private sector investments in the Philippines' renewable energy development. Competitive RE zones, or CRES, were launched to assist in identifying the most economically advantageous areas so that transmission planning and expansion can be accelerated and address development obstacles to renewable energy which will help reduce the risk for private sector renewable energy investment. To date, we have identified 25 competitive renewable energy zones for 58,110 megawatts potential solar power and 93,987 megawatts potential wind power across the Philippines. We've also developed several RE policy mechanisms for implementation in the coming years to achieve our RE targets. Following the Philippine Offshore Wind Roadmap, we will issue a circular defining the procedures and requirements for awarding offshore wind service contracts. And last week, the president signed an executive order to strengthen and rationalize the regulatory framework for the immediate development of offshore wind in the country. Today, the department has awarded 63 offshore wind energy service contracts with a potential capacity of 45,774 megawatts. This is 160% of our current generation capacity. While the numbers look good, the process of bringing wind developers from service contract award to generating the first kilowatt hour is a long one. We still have to work out possessory rights, environmental compliance, 
avoiding marine protected areas, sea lanes, and so on. We have launched an investment promotion mechanism called the Open and Competitive Selection Process, or OXP4, which we, wherein we will offer potential areas for RE development or predetermined areas to private investors. These predetermined areas have sufficient technical data for geothermal, hydropower, and wind energy. To date, the DOE has approved 19 predetermined areas to be offered in the auction this year. A circular providing the list of these PDAs, including the guidelines for the conduct of the open and competitive selection process and the approval of winning entities are targeted in the coming months. Another DOE mechanism for renewable energy is the Green Energy Auction Program, or JAYA, which intends to provide an additional market for RE through competitive electronic bidding of RE capacities. Compared to the first green energy auction for 2000 megawatts last year, we are more aggressive this year, and we're looking for renewable energy developers who have the ready capacity by next year to deliver 3,600 megawatts. And for 2025 and 2026, we need capacity commitments of 3,600 megawatts and 4,400 megawatts respectively, or a total of 11,600 megawatts. On the right side, you will see the timeline of activities, starting with the notice of auction, the followed by issuance of terms of reference, the gear prices are coming out tomorrow, and the registration period, among others. The green energy auction will be conducted in June 2023, just a few more months. I will show the breakdown of uh, RE technology and grid in the following slides. For JA2, we excluded Hydro Runoff River to make way for the Energy Regulatory Commission's FIT2 and FIT3 for Hydro Runoff River. The proposed installation targets under JA2 were determined based on first, capacity needed by the three grids to ensure sufficient supply. Second, the RE capacity levels to meet the target of 35% RE share in the power generation mix by 2030 and 50% by 2040. And third, the volume of RE certificates necessary to comply with the mandates under the renewable portfolio standards. We will include in the terms of reference the list of areas and corresponding capacity of transmission that is already available. This will be provided by the National Grid Corporation of the Philippines. This way we are guaranteed that the generated renewable energy can be transmitted at the projected timelines of 2024 to 2026. A series of discussion and meeting was also done to discuss how transmission development can be accelerated to match the pace of generation development. We will have a third auction of for green energy this year. This is a separate auction intended for geothermal and impounding hydro. The auction will be conducted in the fourth quarter of this year. In preparation for this, we are collaborating with development partners for technical assistance, specifically in developing auction guidelines and policy on settlement and payment through the wholesale electricity spot market. We also have other mandatory RE policy mechanisms including the Renewable Portfolio Standards on grid and off-grid that requires all load-serving entities to source or produce a specified portion of their supply from eligible renewable energy facilities. The RPS off-grid requires a minimum sourcing of a total annual generation by power generators in the missionary areas from available renewable energy resources in the area concerned based on optimal supply mix. The wholesale electricity spot market commercial operation in Mindanao officially started last January 26 of this year. The commercial operation of West and Mindanao is expected to improve the reliability of electric power supply, not only in the Mindanao grid, but also in the zone and desired grids. It will also help facilitate the implementation of other government policy mechanisms currently available only to Luzon and Visayas, including, but not limited, the retail competition and open access, green energy option program, and RE market. And finally, the implementation of the reserve market 
having the reserve market in place will provide the optimal solution for all available capacities when scheduling reserve and energy capacities through call optimization while adhering to grid reliability requirements. We expect the reserve market to be fully operationalized this year. The liberalization of power industry in the Philippines in 2021 has led us to where we are today, a market-driven power sector where competition is possible. In closing, I would like to thank the Leaders Associates again for organizing this webinar. This serves as an avenue for discussing energy challenges and opportunities that allow innovative ideas to propel renewable energy development. On behalf of the Philippine Department of Energy, let me reiterate that we are committed to power up Filipino communities through clean, efficient, robust, and sustainable energy systems that will create wealth, propel industries, and transform the lives of Filipino men and women and generations to come. Thank you for your attention. May we all have positive energy throughout the day. Yes, thank you, Dr. Rowena. Excellent speech and presentation about the Philippines. Um, so, Dr. Rowena, could you answer some questions about uh, from the audience? Of course. Yes. Uh, the first one is, the, could you describe uh, more uh, what the steps are being undertaken by the government for the renewable energy sector? The steps? Yes. What are the steps? Um, like the fun financing sports or something, sports like that? Financing, to say that again, financing? Uh, financing sports financing policy? Oh, okay. Uh, the bottom line is that we basically opened our renewable energy to 100% foreign ownership. Uh, this only happened last November. And in fact, the offer was so attractive that uh, two weeks ago, um, we received uh, intention from um, a Denmark company for $5 billion investment in offshore wind. So by making the policies uh, more open to renewable energy, we're able to encourage investments from the private sector. Remember in the Philippines, we are market driven. Uh, the government does not own uh, generation facilities. Okay, uh, the, the second one is the, we wanna know, so does any uh, offshore wind program will be included in the, the auction, uh, auction in, the, in the June? Ah, not, not yet, because based on our uh, conversations with the offshore wind developers, they will be ready to participate next year. So in the green energy auction in 2024, we will include offshore wind, but not this year yet. Okay, that's, that's all good. Thank you. Thank you again, Dr. Rowena. Thank you for the excellent speech. Okay, thank you. Okay, so... Uh, today, the Mr. Leo will be sharing his the insights on the dramatic shifts in the Philippines energy market and the outlook for the new auction in the June. And the Philippines energy market is undergoing the changes driven by the factors such as increasing demand for the renewable energy sources and the liberalization of the energy markets. So let's welcome the Mr. Leo to speak. Hello. Hi, Hello, good afternoon, Mr. Brian. Let me just uh, Hi, share the slides. Yeah. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Um, Brian, thank you for the invite. Happy to share the Philippine uh, experience, particularly the, the dramatic shift in the Philippine energy outlook, uh, given the recent announcement of the Department of Energy for the auction in June 2023. Um, this uh, shows a quick outline of what I will discuss. Um, I'll start off with the legal framework and then quickly discuss also what we have currently on the RE mechanisms. And then finally, uh, give you an overview of the auction, which will happen in June. Now, uh, currently, as shown also by the previous speaker, uh, under Secretary Guevara, we have about 26,286 megawatts installed capacity 
And of those uh, installed capacity, about 29% come from renewables, uh, primarily geothermal and hydro. And we have a lot of solar installations as of late. Now, the Philippines through the years uh, have had a lot of power plants, of course, um, and you will see in this data that we have aging power plants. Um, power plants that have been operating for more than 21 years, uh, and you will count them to, they will count to about 6,500 megawatts. Now, as a result of that, uh, every time, every summertime where uh, peak demand is at its highest, we usually uh, experience some outages and therefore result in not enough reserves. So you will see the projection of the Department of Energy that for the months of May and June, we may have possibility of having yellow uh, alerts. No? Now, the way to do that, of course, is we need to increase our installed capacity. And luckily for the Philippines, we have a lot of renewables. We call this the big show. We have biomass, we have geothermal, we have solar, hydro, ocean, and wind. And unfortunately, for the last 10 years, you will see here in terms of um, output, no, it's installed capacity once upon a time, uh, renewables was at 34%, went down to 29%, but it looks worse on actual energy generated. You will note from uh, the screen that now renewables is down to 20.8% and coal is up to 54%. No? We want to reduce this because, as you know, coal prices have been going up compared to renewables, which actually are going down in terms of cost. So, of course, we were lucky, and you will see this data. And this is the reason why, of course, the government wants to do another auction. In, in the screen, you will see that from 2014, 2015, and 2016, and, of course, 2019, there were a lot of installed capacities on renewables. There is one reason behind those years. That's the feed-in tariff system. In other words, that fits its system work. And uh, as a result of that, more power plants came into place. Now, unfortunately, because we are now to 20, down to 28.8% of renewables, our self-sufficiency has also gone down. We want to reverse this. We want to reach the levels of almost 70% uh, energy independence. That's what we are targeting. Um, of course, the Philippines is a growing economy. We have a 4.4% uh, growth in annual demand for power, and therefore we need more megawatts. No? That's for the entire Philippines. Uh, very quickly, we have two important laws on renewables. The first one, of course, is the Constitution, Article 12, Section 2. And then we have the Renewable Energy Act of 2008. Now, earlier, uh, our Honorable Undersecretary Guevara explained that we have now removed the restriction of uh, nationality restriction on renewables. Once upon a time, the interpretation of Article 12, Section 2, is that for solar, wind, uh, and hydro, it must be 6040 you know, as provided in the provision that you see. No? And that was also the interpretation before of the DOE. That's why it issued the IRR, the implementing rule, saying that for all forces of potential energy and other natural resources, it must be 60-40% owned. But that all changed. Uh, that changed during the, uh, the new administration under the new secretary, uh, Secretary Lutilia. And this time, uh, the DOJ Department of Energy, uh, Department of Justice, issued an opinion, and in explaining the non-applicability of the 6040, the DOJ said that we should not apply the 40 percent uh, limitation, because when we talk about solar and wind, you know, these are these are not considered to be natural resources. You know? These are actually considered more kinetic, you know? and therefore, as an interpretation that 6040 limitation should not apply. Now, this has resulted in a lot of interest, therefore, in the Philippines. Now, we've seen the onslaught of foreign investors coming here because now they have control both in voting and in economic interest. Now, um, the RE law was passed in 2008, and we have a lot of incentives now, under that law. We have the fiscal 
and the non-fiscal incentives. Now, I will not, not go uh, through each one of them, but what I can say is that we have a buffet of incentives for renewables in the Philippines. Uh, that means you go develop a renewable energy project and you get all these benefits. But it does not end in fiscal. We have the non-fiscal incentives and we have implemented a lot of them in the past. We had the feed and tariff system. We have the net metering program. We have the RPS for it's a mandate to all utilities to acquire uh, renewable energy power supply agreements, both for on-grid and off-grid areas. And of course, we have the green energy option program. For those with at least 100 kilowatt demand, you can now supply directly your electricity requirements from an RE supplier, right? The DOE also issued the RE market rules, which cover the issuance of RE certificates, which uh, will serve as a form of compliance for RPS. Now let's go to the auction, which has created a lot of interest and of course, a lot of excitement. You know, um, the purpose of this auction is definitely to invite all of you foreign investors to come join in the Philippines and build these projects. Now you have that option to look for those projects and offer it for bidding. And, and similar to the first auction, what is important is your bid will not be higher than the gear price, the green energy auction reserve price. That is what we consider the maximum price. No? Whatever, therefore, you bid below that, if you still fall within the installed capacity of the government, then you will get that for a period of 20 years. So the first thing to do is you register as a qualified supplier, then register as a bidder, then you get your auction ID. And online, you submit your offers. All right. Now, ultimately, you will be declared the winner, provided your gear price is below uh, the um, your bid is below the gear price set by the ERC, and you fall within the installed capacity set out by the government. We expect, of course, the gear price to be finally released by the regulator, the Energy Regulatory Commission, tomorrow. That's the deadline. Now, the excitement came because the government, the DOE, uh, set very ambitious uh, targets. And with good reason, because as I've said, no, we need a lot of new capacities given how those plants are aging already, mostly coal. So every year, the DOE set specific targets per grid. No? So we have Luzon, Visayas, Mindanao, and per technology. So as an example, if you have a potential solar plant that can go online by 2024, go bid. No? If it's located in Luzon, there's a 1,420 allocation for you. So let's say you bid 50 megawatts. Obviously, you will fall within the 1,420 because it's a big number. Then you get that price that you bid it for, you know, subject to the maximum of the gear price. So everyone's very excited because the number set by the DOE is very high. So we're definitely encouraging everybody. Now, it's not just solar, not just ground-mounted solar. The DOE also set uh, allocation for roof-mounted solar. Uh, we also they've also set specifically for waste to energy. So all these are possible projects that you can submit for bidding. Now, what's important, of course, uh, it's already April, but for registration purposes, there's a deadline on May 12. Okay, it opens on May 3. You can register until May 12, and then there will be a pre pre bid evaluation and a pre-bid conference. And finally, the bidding will happen on June 19. So, so many things to do. No? I hope you all participate. The DOE already uh, set out the requirements. Submit your registration form, your LOI, a, a duly notarized affidavit of undertaking, and your secretary certificate or board resolution. And then in that uh, letter informing the DOE, you need to indicate all these data, particularly the location of the project, which grid you are connecting to, and the type of RE resource you are utilizing. And once you get all these documents, you prepare them, you electronically submit them 
to this email provided by the government in specific formats. Here, the DOE indicated a zip format, and you need to put certain tags and names to it. Now, the gear price, as I mentioned, is set by the regulator. Uh, subject to certain parameters. No? The gear price that you will see here, that you see on the screen, is actually the same model that we used for the feed-in tariff way back in 2011, no? which became which served as the basis for the 2012 fit prices. It is th those parameters that we continue to use, uh, that the ERC continues to use to set now the gear prices. No? So during the first auction, the gear prices set for solar was 3.6, wind was 6, biomass at 5.0, run of river hydro at 5.49. Now, of course, this is the first auction. The hope is on April 27, the ERC will update these gear prices and will reflect you know, uh, current circumstances. As you know, this was before Ukraine, the ones that you see now. We are hoping that the prices will be a little bit higher to reflect no, the changes in the costs. Okay, um, the Philippines is very aggressive to attract most uh, many investors. Uh, as a result of all these rules, you have so many markets for your power project. You know, go sell to a DU, a distribution utility under the RPS. Go neg negotiate a green energy option supply contract. Uh, participate in the green energy auction. And of course, if you wish, if you want to be a merchant plant without an offtake, you can go sell your power at the wholesale electricity spot market because you have priority dispatch. We have seen entry of a lot of these new players in the Philippines. And of course, the Philippines is not stuck to current technologies. We're looking at um, floating solar. We're also looking at offshore wind. Under the World Bank study, we have identified six development zones. And we're hoping that by 2028, 2029, we will have our first offshore wind project in the Philippines. The DOE launched also the amended National Renewable Energy Program with a target of 50% by 2040. The Philippines has improved its system via an online platform service. So all permits can be applied through EVOS. And of course, as I mentioned, the preferential dispatch for renewable energy power plants. Now, we're hoping that with all these changes, uh, you are encouraged, and we look forward to seeing all of you investors in the Philippines. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Mr. J. Um, do I have the one question? Could, could you please answer it? Sure. Uh, yeah. Uh, so we know the, the drone action in the Philippines is really a hot topic. So um, what is the most asked question about the the drone action. So it's the a uh, land use problem, uh, contract uh, contract problem or policy problem, um, uh, like about the the drone action. So what is the the most asked question? Well, uh, for purposes of the bidding, Ryan, uh, you don't need yet uh, uh, to address any issues regarding land, no. Uh, if you wish, uh, one of the requirements of the DOE is you file your letter of intent with uh, the specific area that you will use for your project. You can get the land lease rights after that. No, but you have to make sure you get it because if you win in the bid and you don't get it, you will lose your, your uh, bid bond or your performance bond. No? So please make sure whatever you bid as a project is a really viable project for you that you can get your possessory rights eventually. Okay, thank you. Thank you again, Mr. J. That's a nice speech. So uh, next place, let me uh, introduce uh, our next keynote speaker for today is the Mr. Wilhelm. is uh, our area manager for the energy storage at Wasira Energy. He will highlight the opportunities and the challenges at, at the ASEAN countries facing the energy storage technologies and provide his expert analyze on the future of the energy storage in the ASEAN region. So let's welcome Mr. Wilhelm. Thank you very much, Ryan. Welcome, everyone. Um, I will just share my screen. There we go. 
Is that visible? Yes. Okay, very good. Okay. So, um, yeah, so um, the last two speakers uh, gave us already an insight of um, uh, what's to come, uh, which all sounds very positive. Um, and we are all very excited also from the industry point of view here. Um, uh, on that picture here, you see an example of an application in the US. Um, and that's exactly what we are going to talk about in the next couple of years. And I guess even in the further future, it is energy storage in combination with renewable energies. Um, so what I will talk about here is just give a very quick intro of a, a possible path to net zero, then um, a little bit of energy capacity additions globally, and then focus more on our region and uh, the Philippines in particular. Um, then I would like to talk a little bit about the um, solutions and applications that um, have been deployed uh, here in the region um, and those which will be deployed because we see a little shift there between uh, use cases. Um, and then how energy storage is integrated into the renewable. A few um, additional information about, um, about the Philippines and its market itself, um, and then a couple of examples what that could look like. Um, so what we are looking at globally, and I think that's what we have heard, especially from our last speaker, is uh, first, you know, uh, to add renewables, um, to uh, get, take the first step of getting away from uh, from uh, too heavy uh, CO2, CO2 production um, after um, a certain amount has been installed. And I think that's where we are in the Philippines as well. Uh, you need to focus more on bal balancing with engines and, and storage. As we know, um, renewables alone uh, can be uh, quite uh, volatile. And after that, um, you then have the possibility um, to, to phase out uh, existing uh, base power plants. After that, we would then uh, convert those uh, left uh, to sustainable fuels and then ultimately uh, have the full 100% of renewables in a country. So that's the theory. If we look into the um, uh, real life scenario of what is to come, and in particular, I would like to focus on the right hand side because we're talking about Asia Pacific. Um, that will play uh, one key role here uh, amongst the four biggest markets around the world. Um, North America, as we know, has been very strong and will stay very strong. Um, uh, Europe, and in particular in the later future, um, uh, China. Uh, but um, all the other countries uh, surrounding us and the Philippines themselves um, are very promising and there is a lot of work to do. Um, also from our point of view, and this slide is not really there to show you uh, the, the strength of our presence around the world, but just to show you that um, also with our experience so far um, and, and those projects that have been installed, you can see again that uh, Southeast Asia um, uh, together with Australia um, are really and steadily uh, uh, exponentially growing. Um, and you see a lot of dots there in the Philippines because there is, has been um, a lot happening already. Um, and I will talk about those cases uh, a little bit further. Um, just a little focus on who are the main partners uh, or those who are requesting energy storage. Um, I think it's the whole uh, supply chain uh, in terms of generation, transmission and distribution. Um, uh, we can see all of those actors and stakeholders in the markets being very, very active, uh, deploying and operating energy storage, mainly today in conjunction with renewables, but also standalone energy storage. There is a few more very specific use cases for the Philippines, and I will introduce them now. Um, so what we've seen so far was really about stabilizing an existing grid. Um, we know since about 2013, um, especially between 2013 and 16, there has been a huge amount of renewables, uh, in particular PV, installed in the Philippines. Um, uh, and back then, there was not so much on a fo uh, focus on uh, grid stability itself. It was more of getting the capacity of renewables um, connected. So since then, the request for frequency regulation or frequency response has been the highest. We're talking here about standalone batteries. Um, but as I said, um, with uh, increased installations of renewables and in particular uh, PV, we will see a lot of uh, use cases around capacity firming, uh, um, energy shifting, and also ramping and smoothing. 
Um, and that's exactly what uh, I would like to talk about here, a little bit more about solar plus storage, uh, which gives us the possibility to um, have very constant uh, energy and power supplies if they are connected uh, to energy storage systems. So um, if we look here uh, into capacity firming, what we are talking about here is in most of the cases, a power purchase agreement or PSA uh, as it's called in the Philippines, to um, have not only a solar system, which is rather not so predictable in its power output, but in conjunction with an energy storage system, so that both together uh, can be included into a contract of a constant power supply, usually during sunlight hours, um, usually between 9 and about 5 to 6 uh, p.m. Uh, to uh, supply a certain constant power into a grid. Um, that is one way of using those combinations. Another one is, of course, um, if you talk about energy shifting, then that means you can have a constant power supply during the day, but you would also like to shift energy into the evening, where, of course, the sun is not shining, but you still need a lot of energy for lighting um, and also uh, because in the, uh, especially uh, private um, in the evening, there is a lot of um, energy being needed, still air cons are running, still there's a lot of cooking going on. Uh, so you can see that actually reflected in the, um, in, in, in the power curve of a, of a public grid. Um, another challenge, and that is really um, um, specific to not only the Philippines, but very strong here, because we're talking about a lot of islanded grids, which mainly is on islands, but also um, remote regions, remote power supply, which is not connected to a public grid, which has its own challenges. Um, if you would have only base load power, then um, you would look here at a very high cost. You would look at an instability because you cannot really uh, control with base load power an, an off-grid system, which is rather small. Um, renewables penetration needs to be controlled and then uh, peak shifting into the evening is necessary. So you see island grids, which are requested a lot here in the country and in the region, have their own requests. And it's usually a lot of use cases um, combined together. Um, another one is um, if you have um, a grid running with um, engines and you would like to integrate uh, renewables, then you can see here on the right-hand side, um, integration of solar can easily be done. Um, it would not only reduce the fuel consumption, but it would also reduce the O&M because running hours of engines are much shorter um, and uh, hence the, the time and uh, efforts you have to invest to, to operate them are reduced. This is by the way, one of the most lucrative use cases with energy storage we've seen. Um, in particular about the Philippines, I've just made some notes here. Um, there are a lot of advantages. Um, uh, for quite some time, uh, energy storage guidelines are in place. Um, mostly they were focusing on ancillary services, frequency response, as I've mentioned that before. Um, but uh, there are there is already a next round of improvements, which includes and mentions renewable energies. Many more use cases uh, have been covered there, uh, which is a release, um, and most of um, the participants here might know that from the DOE, uh, which still has to be officially um, released. Um, one of the key uh, improvements here is also that multiple use cases um, are covered. That means you not only would do frequency response, you can at the same time interact and work together with renewable energy systems, um, and more kinds of use cases are are covered here and well the ess market in the philippines is not uh, in its baby shoes anymore uh, there, there has been a lot of uh, systems installed there is um, experience in place um, and the guidelines as i said have matured already um, a few challenges which i believe will be uh, solved very soon is that still 100 percent of installation has to be done before a grid connection uh, application can be placed um, system impact studies, um, which is a bit of a bottleneck right now, because there's a long waiting queue as well for NGCP to perform those system impact studies is quite long. We're talking about waiting times over a year. And uh, currently, the revenue landscape is uh, rather tight, not saying that there's no business case, but it could be much better. And with what we heard before, the um, uh, announced 11.6 uh, gigawatts of renewables, 
uh, we do believe that also the payment landscape for um, uh, the, the work with uh, energy storage um, will be much more lucrative. Um, just a few examples here. Uh, this is an example just recently uh, installed in Australia, which deals exactly with, um, with uh, the, the, the balancing of um, renewable energies. Renewables here are not placed locally directly next to the, um, to the energy storage system. However, um, this is located in South Australia, and uh, there is a lot of uh, renewable installed in the state of South Australia, and hence uh, that battery takes care for um, not the instability, but for the effects of renewables connected to that grid. Um, this one is the one here in the Philippines. Um, I guess everyone knows there has been a big round of uh, SMC installing uh, energy storage systems. We've been part of that, and hence uh, you see a picture here as an example of a 20, 20 megawatt hours um, uh, frequency response system, which in um, underlying uh, functionalities here is not only frequency response, those systems are also taking care for certain uh, power factor levels. Um, and um, hence, there are actually more use cases, but mentioned for revenue streams is frequency response. So that was pretty much in a nutshell, the, the view, our point of view from the industry on the Philippine market. I know there is a lot more to tell. Uh, there is a lot more we could cover here. Uh, we could probably talk a whole day about what's happening here because it's again, all very positive. We see uh, tendencies towards um, a much more busy and much larger uh, market for renewables and energy storage uh, for local companies and international companies. And hence uh, we stay very excited. Um, that's it from my end. Um, open for questions, of course. Back to you, Ryan. Okay. Hello? Yes. Hello, Mr. Mehan. Could you hear me? Yes, yes. Yes. Um, I have a one question I want to ask you. Uh, yeah. This is a question is about the battery storage. So um, it's not only for the ASEAN region. So what do you think um, the battery storage will be becoming more competitive in the near future? What do you think? Yes, yes, yes. So um, I think that's a very good question because there has been a lot happening around the energy storage price in the past two years, especially what we have seen during COVID where everything became more expensive. But it, in particular here, the prices went up because of two factors, mainly because of raw material prices went up, um, but also transportation went up by an average of 500%. So we see that all those prices came back down again. There is a very positive tendency. And we believe that in, in about one and a half to two years time, it is actually exactly back where we expected it before to be. So um, the price is, um, is, is dropping um, and which makes also the business cases in particular here in the Philippines uh, much more lucrative again. So I think all those developments are very positive. That's, that's good. Thank, thank you again. Thank you again, Mr. Wilhelm. Thank you for your wonderful presentation. So sure. um, by the way, the, yeah, thank you. By the way, the Dr. Rowena will um, talk talk me to what news is about. Uh, they will have the new Philippine ESS policy will be published today in the newspapers. So if anyone want very interesting about that, just be attention in the newspaper or any news. Um, so let me promptly to introduce the our final section is our final discussion for today. So I'm sorry as you are waiting for a long time for us. So uh, the first one is the Mr. Sharad. He's the moderator of today. He's come from the KPMG and the Ms. Isabel. She's from the IFC Singapore and uh, Mr. Nassan. He's uh, from the Black and the Vitek. They were talking about the foreign direct investment considerations in the ASEAN energy sector with the spotlight on the Philippines. Welcome then. All right, thank you. Uh, can you hear me, Ryan? Yeah. All right, hi, good afternoon. Um, I know this has been an engaging last couple of hours. Uh, we have heard extremely insightful uh, developments from Indonesia, Thailand, Malaysia, and Philippines. And this is uh, really encouraging that a number of interesting initiatives, projects are being launched. 
in fact, uh, I just wanted to share one slide before we introduce our speakers and deep dive into what's what's happening. Uh, so if you indulge uh, uh, me for a minute, uh, can you can you all see the slide that I am presenting? Yes, yes, we can see it. Okay. So just wanted to highlight that, uh, and this slide kind of captures uh, what is happening and what was very eloquently highlighted by all the speakers from the four countries that we covered today. Uh, clearly, decarbonization is a big theme uh, in the region. And if you were to look at the broad drivers, uh, we could easily say that a renewable energy is going to be the biggest investment opportunity in coming years. And, and Philippines with a 11 gigawatt of uh, green energy auction program too uh, is an is a immediate opportunity over the next three years. But if you look at broader trends in the region, the big three things that stand out, one is, uh, of course, uh, renewable energy, uh, which is primarily driven by solar uh, wind is going to be driving factor and requires a fair bit of investment to reach our targets of 23% renewable energy in the primary energy mix in the whole region by 2025. The second big theme, uh, which was highlighted by some of the speakers, uh, is interconnection, which is regional grid on how we can optimize the, the green energy uh, sharing in the region. And that's where the broader interconnect discussion uh, should become very, very important. And the third thing I think which was also eloquently highlighted uh, as an investment opportunity is looking at demand side measures, energy efficiency, transport uh, related solutions and new technology solutions. So these are the big three themes uh, I hope uh, we can touch upon uh, as part of the discussion. Mm -hmm. The number of other stuff uh, which, uh, which keep happening like nature-based solutions, carbon trading, which was also touched upon in the previous uh, presentations. So time permitting, we'll, we'll look at that. I know that we are running terribly behind schedule by 45 minutes, which is good because the presentations were insightful. I would try to make up on the time uh, by probably limiting this panel to 30 minutes. And of course, welcome any questions on the chat as well as uh, on uh, if you were to raise it after the panel uh, discussion. So let me start by uh, introducing myself. My name is Sharad Somani. I'm, I'm heading the infrastructure and ESG practice for KPMG covering the region. And I've got uh, two distinguished panelists with me here, uh, which is, uh, uh, Isabel, Isabel Chetterton is uh, is leader in IFC driving the infrastructure in the region, and uh, Narsing Chaudhary is is leading uh, the Black and Boots initiative in the broader energy transition. So, if it is all right, uh, I may invite uh, Isabel and then uh, Narsing to start by giving their take on the subject and why they are so passionate about this area. Isabel. Well, delighted to be here today. Um, so, first of all, I just wanted to say that. We have been a big financier of hydropower, geothermal, and renewable energy in the Philippines. And I wanted to highlight that more recently, we have seen a, a significantly heightened activity in the renewable space in the country. And uh, clearly, that's on the back of what the Undersecretary mentioned today, right? The government of the Philippines has really accelerated a lot of changes and policies and enabling environment for renewable energy development. So, so really, we're delighted to see the heightened interest. Um, we, we've done some recent investments across ASEAN. Um, for example, we've invested recently in, in a green bond with a growing Thai developer. Uh, we also um, are looking right now into some ASEAN investments in renewable energy and batteries, some of these combined hybrid projects. We had another investment. This one was 52 megawatt. That's, that was a, a solar power plant in Thailand. So clearly, we're growing a lot of our portfolio in renewable energy. But but the the biggest changes that have that we have seen across ASEAN are actually coming out of the Philippines. Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of the Philippines, we are in active discussions with local players. Uh, but increasingly, again, on the back of the changes that the government has implemented. Um, primarily the change that happened in November, we have seen increasingly foreign players coming into partnership with local partners, or actually even independently, uh, which hadn't been the case in a while in the Philippines. Um, so we're clearly looking to develop a, a, a range of renewable energy projects across all the technologies, solar, wind, hydro. Um, we are looking to support players through both project finance and corporate finance. 
and and in any case through capital market instruments or or or, or privately placed financing we have been looking at offshore wind um and that was one of the sessions that were discussed today and i'll be happy to answer some questions later on but some of you may know that the world bank group commissioned um a, a philippines offshore wind map in 2022 and that was under the joint energy sector assessment assistant program that we have with the with the with SMAP and, and FC. And we actually released that development program in 2022. And we have ongoing conversations that look into specific ways that FC can actually finance and support the private sector. Um, so we do think that that there is quite a bit of work that we can do in the in the offshore wind space in the Philippines, including through what we call the upstream window in IFC, which goes in earlier than early stage investments, and they develop, um, you know, try to develop the markets and develop a bankable pipeline. But um, let me stop there. I just want to say that we're extremely excited about the changes that we've seen mm -hmm. and, and extremely excited, of course, about um, all the potential investments, including, for example, pumped hydropower storage. Um, as you know, that's not a new technology uh, and has gained more ground in, I would say, recent years. Um, as an ideal clean energy storage solution for grids that are reliant on intermittent solar and wind. And we wonder if, if pump storage could potentially be one of those competitive um, assets in the Philippines if more than four hour storage is needed. So, but let me stop there, really delighted to be here today and, and happy to chime in as required. Thank you. Thank you, Isabel. And I think that was a very important point on storage, which we should definitely touch upon, because as the proportion of renewable energy goes up in the grid, uh, we would have to look at solution for the intermittency uh, in addition to strengthening the grid, isn't it? Uh, that's a good segue for nursing to come in and introduce what BV is doing in the sector nursing. Yeah, thank you, Sharad. Uh, uh, for those who don't know me, uh, my name is Nursing. I'm based in Singapore. I take care of Black uh, Black and Beaches business in, in Asia Pacific across all market sectors, not just energy. Um, to give a, a short overview of what Black and Beach does, uh, we are not a very renowned company, but in the space that we operate, people know us uh, because we do uh, quite a bit of work. Um, Black and Beach has been in the business for more than 109 years. We are a US based company. Uh, with more than 10,000 employees across the world. Started as an engineering company. We still believe our DNA and core of our, you know, what we do is uh, is our engineering competence. Um, we started in Asia around 50 years back. We have uh, across all our offices close to 2,000 employees today. So it's a pretty big setup where many people are not familiar. Last year, we added in Indonesia uh, close to 4 gigawatt, which we build as an EPC. Now, uh, in a Energy transition forum, uh, I shouldn't say that all of them were coal, uh, but this was historical projects that uh, we had uh, taken a couple of years back, adding uh, all the four gigawatts were in the uh, Java grid. Uh, but in 2020, uh, the company decided to exit the coal market altogether. And, um, you know, this was uh, a decision which was taken, uh, uh, keeping sustainability in mind. Uh, in Asia, 80% of our revenue was coming from coal business. We were one of the biggest players, and it was a big move by the company to stop it completely. And why I say that is the dilemma with respect to uh, financials versus, you know, what we look at as the bigger picture of what organizations, what people, what governments, <coughs> sorry, I have a bad thought, should be doing uh, with respect to, you know, creating the uh, the uh, right business decisions. Uh, this was a good demonstration. And I, I was working prior to that with Siemens uh, 26 years before I joined Black and Beach. And so it was a big hit for us here in the region. But I must say the transition for the company here in the region was super fantastic. We stopped coal, we stopped bidding any new projects. And in 2021, 2022, and now we are in 2023, our transition into more cleaner energy has never been better actually. And it was just because we shut the doors completely on coal. We were able to train people, bring new people on board into the uh, different developments. So today, uh, we are, this year we added 1.4 gigawatt in Thailand. This was a project for EGAP uh, based on gas. We are building a 1.3 gigawatt power plant uh, in Philippines. Uh, this is for the last CSP which got announced. 
But we are working also on a lot of renewable projects in the Philippines where either a solar or battery energy storage or combination of both. And to be honest, I'm amazed at the speed at which the energy transition has picked up. Sharad, you uh, showed this slide a couple of uh, you know, minutes ago uh, with respect to what's happening in the different countries. I mean, ASEAN is the most diverse region with respect to when we talk about energy transition is the most diverse. I mean, we have countries like Singapore, which is talking about green ammonia, green hydrogen, even transitioning away from gas and bringing in more cleaner source. But we also have countries where 60% of the energy mix is today coal. And that transition is not going to be easy. Uh, it's just because the governments have to find the right balance of being able to find a uh, reliable base load and uh, renewable, we all know, that's not the most reliable one, uh, reliable base load, which can be in terms of uh, not just the reliability, but also from a cost perspective, uh, can be affordable for, for the government to be able to pass it on to the consumers. So a lot of work being done. Uh, we are seeing huge interest on uh, SMR technology, which is the small and medium nuclear reactors, which we all thought that was dead. A uh, lot of pumped hydro, I mean, battery energy storage is a very solid technology on energy storage, but we are seeing a lot of hydropower projects as pump storage, which is, in my opinion, the best storage system because the cost with respect to the overall implementation is high, but uh, there is uh, the opportunity to have longer term energy storage. So there are a lot of alternative. Uh, people ask me what is the best solution. I always tell them as an engineer, it depends. I mean, it depends where the project is located, what are the uh, you know, uh, various factors which are going to impact the project. So some project might be a good opportunity for gas, but in a lot of other places where gas might not be an alternative solution, might be better to do a combination of pump hydro, geothermal, or, or alternative solar plus wind, a combination along with battery energy story. So okay. I'm truly excited what I see in the uh, energy transition. And it's, it's really good to see governments finally stepping up, bringing the right changes. And it's amazing to see what Philippines has achieved in the last two years. I mean, kudos to the government. Indeed, indeed. Well, thanks, thanks, Tazing. And I think uh, uh, both Isabel and you have set the stage right in terms of the broader energy transition opportunities that we see. And I agree with you that the, the diversity in this region is quite amazing in the stage of development of each market being so different that the number of markets can also learn from each other, isn't it? But the broader, you touched upon uh, energy storage and pump storage and other technology options. And when the countries in the region are looking for, they're looking for the broader balancing the, the energy trilemma, isn't it? With the security, affordability, and sustainability become important component. And as we see number of utilities driving towards renewable energy, and you're right to highlight that fossil fuel still contributes majority of our generation in the region and also possibly in the foreseeable future. Uh, maybe we, we probably touch upon uh, what are the technology challenges and changes that you see nursing coming from Black & Rich as a leading engineering technology company. Uh, and what are the things that you envisage in the next five years, let's say, and you touched upon hydrogen and SMR and other stuff as well. So it'll be good to hear from you where you see technology going in our energy transition space in next five years. And Isabel, I think following that, may be useful to understand from you, what are the financiers' appetite for some of the new technology solutions that are coming? And you know, you as a part of World Bank Group, how do you see multilaterals supporting some of this energy transition in a proactive fashion? Uh, would be good to hear from you. So Nasik, first uh, starting with you on the technology uh, for that. Yeah, sure, uh, I mean, that's a beautiful uh, question that you put in. Maybe let me address it by putting the solutions under two buckets. Uh, I mean, the first bucket is the mature technologies which are there, uh, whether it's combined cycle power plants or solar developments or onshore wind development. These are fairly, I would say, mature technologies. We are seeing a lot of installations and enough capacity, not only in terms of OEMs, but also in terms of uh, you know resources being available to engineer and build those and you know work across the whole supply chain. And then there are alternative uh, options, which are hydrogen, green hydrogen, green ammonia. We talk about SMR, offshore wind, where I, I, I guess the technology is there, 
we are building the world's first green hydrogen facility in US and it's in Utah. 100% uh, uh, wind energy as the primary source for uh, the power for that particular power uh, for that hydrogen facility. It's, uh, it's a huge facility, uh, one of the biggest commercially. Uh, but in terms of when I look at the challenges which are there when you build a new green hydrogen facility, there is no parallel, the code standard, safety, everything else. You can't just take the book and then say, okay, I will apply this codes and standards. So while we are building that, we're also learning, working with the regulators. And, and the from a cost perspective, I think the cost has come down. We were talking of around $20 a kg. The new plans mm -hmm. that we are doing feasibility study or the one that we are building, the cost is in the range of $6 to $8 a kg, which I believe the technology, as it becomes more mature, the cost will come down. So green hydrogen is a reality, but the problem is when you uh, produce green hydrogen, what do you do with that green hydrogen? You can't do marine transportation today because the technology is still not there, but you can convert it into green ammonia and green ammonia can be easily transported. So we have to look at those. On that particular project, what they're doing is they're using the hydrogen for feeding into a power plant, which is just nearby. The, uh, the uh, hydrogen is mixed with the natural gas 30% and will be used to fire the power plant. There's a 450 megawatt power plant. And we're also building salt caverns where we'll store naturally uh, the green hydrogen, which is generated. And some of the green hydrogen will also be used for generating hydrogen fuel cells. So all those technologies could be easily brought here and adopted. We're working on some feasibility study here in the region. SMR has been a very mature technology. The challenge with SMR is it needs a lot of government approvals. I mean, it's not B2B, which can work there. It also needs the engagement of the governments because uh, of the nature of the raw material which is being used, including the disposal of that. But the technology is pretty safe. Uh, we, have, we are closely monitoring what's happening in, in Philippines, in Vietnam, and Indonesia on the new interest of bringing SMR here. But the technology is mature, actually. It's pretty safe as compared to large nuclear. Pumped hydro, battery energy storage, I mean, these are fairly stable technologies as well, but they are very geographic, uh, I would say, location dependent, uh, which should be the best choice for that. Uh, but there are also technologies where we're looking at waste to energy uh, or maybe capturing carbon and converting into methane gas, which can be fed back into the system. So there are a lot of technologies which are there. I don't think uh, any of this technology will work for all the locations. As I mentioned earlier, there has to be some studies done to look at what is the best fit, both from a techno technology and economics perspective. Okay. Well, thanks for that. And each country has to think of pathways and, uh, and uh, approach of collating different technology solutions rather than you know looking at one option, isn't it? So a basket Absolutely. of technologies yeah. will be important for energy transition. Isabel, what's your take on financing of some of these new technologies? And do you see a lot of those projects coming to you? Um, indeed, actually, I think our take is that we will substantially scale up financing for clean energy transitions across all these technologies. As you know, we have played a role through both utility scale projects and small scale projects alike. Um, but clearly with a fast declining cost of renewable energy and energy storage technologies, combined with a lot of innovative business models we're seeing, we, we really are facing significant opportunity to expand our financing for energy access and energy transition. So without a doubt, um, overall, I think we're gonna continue to invest not only in renewable energy generation, but also integration and enabling infrastructure. You, you may know that, but the World Bank Group is really the largest multilateral financier of, for example, mini grids and off-grid solar. Um, very often people forget about this um, and, and it's their support that has really scaled up a lot of uh, the ability to do on-grid and on off-grid and distributed renewables. So, um, uh, for example, we've been a key partner in the energy storage partnership uh, that has been convened by the World Bank with, if I remember correctly, 35 industry multilateral partners working to advance research. So we are very much supportive of, of technology. One item that I wanted to mention is that energy transition depends critically on key minerals. And several of these minerals are mined in developing countries. Um, in the World Bank Group, we have the Climate Smart Mining Initiative, which I don't know if you're aware of, but it really supports private sector mining projects in those key minerals. And it's gonna support 
the sustainable extraction, processing and recycling of minerals and metals, which are very much needed for these low carbon technologies. Um, uh, so that's definitely a space where we're very keen to continue to support. Um, as offshore technologies in, in offshore wind mature and the costs continue to decline, we do think that there's significant potential for us to expand their use, um, particularly in emerging markets. Uh, the, the offshore wind program, it's, it's uh, assisting emerging markets in accelerating the, the wind uptake, and it's a program that was launched in 2018 uh, across the World Bank Group. Um, I've seen in I've seen across regions, we're actually trying to leverage the experience in these kind of projects that we have gathered globally to make sure that we have we help create markets with new technologies and new business models. So overall, we're extremely excited about this space. You mentioned green hydrogen. Um, we we do think that we're able to facilitate some transformative penetration of some innovative renewable energies in, in some clan countries. And that we think is gonna include green hydrogen. We already have a give or take about two dozen worth of initiatives in green hydrogen. Some are a small market studies all the way to already engagements with clients, um, not only in specifically in generation, but it could be in other parts, you know, it could be in self-transportation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we we do think that these are technologies that all of us have to invest in. One one last point I wanted to mention, which has not been highlighted today, is this the space of energy efficiency. Very often we forget that one of the largest untapped sources of energy, and scanning it up is quite critical in energy transition, is actually energy efficiency, and it is a simple and low cost way to to some extent expand energy services. We have quite a lot of interest in financing potential clients who are interested in utilizing efficiency to reduce, um, you know, energy supply needs and and fiscal outlays for subsidies, cost of consumers. I mean, there's a, a really significant uh, impacts on economy and on companies. Uh, so we also think that energy efficiency is is a key part of the equation. Not only investing in new technologies, which we will, of course, but we also need to look at at the efficiency with which the additional energy that is being put into the grid is actually utilized. So we will definitely look into that as well. Indeed, indeed. I think the power saved is power generated, isn't it? Um, and, and I think Irina also has this in their 1.5 degree uh, pathway as energy efficiency and energy savings as a key agenda. But you are right. I think if you look at the real estate sector or the industrial sector, There'll be a lot of focus on energy efficiency and reducing the, the energy intensity of economy in general uh, going forward. I might take the liberty to weave in some of the questions which are being asked on the chat as part of our discussion uh, so that we can optimize on time. Uh, but coming back to some of the thoughts you had on the green hydrogen and you know, I think you talked about the competitive notes of that. Uh, as far as the solar is concerned and to some extent wind, I think we have kind of reached grid parity, right? And the kind of solar projects we saw in Vietnam and the kind of pipeline of projects that are being uh, put up in Philippines. Uh, the questions uh, refer to two things. One is because of renewable energy and perhaps storage, is it going to lead to increase in tariff uh, in the grid? Uh, and the second question is what role do we play? Uh, do we see RECs and carbon credit play in the broader funding, financing? of renewable energy projects. Uh, so Isabel, if you have any thoughts on this, I'll be welcome. And then perhaps nursing, you can take it from the technical perspective and your discussions with foreign investors on importance of this as well. Yeah, I mean, Sharad, I'm seeing a shift in change in mindset, actually. Uh, you know, when, when I look at uh, when renewables uh, started initially here in the region, it was all about uh, direct return of any investment, right? So if you invest X dollars, I need to have a certain IRR. And what I'm seeing is the new investments people are also taking into consideration. What could it mean in future? Mm -hmm. Could there be a possibility to be able to trade, uh, you know, uh, with carbon trading coming in, could that mean additional revenue? Uh, could it mean that, you know, their company share prices could be a lot better value as somebody who might not be doing it actually? So it's, it's good to see some of those discussions coming in. The parity on the, on the cost, if you look at solar uh, uh, to a certain extent on onshore wind, 
it's really a positive. But for some of us who remember, the cost of solar used to be three times the cost that it is today. And it has been achieved through uh, uh, two, uh, two things. One is the technology has improved. For per square meter of a solar panel, we are generating much more energy than we used to maybe 10 years back, actually. So that's one. The second one is, as you know, we all know, the, uh, as the uh, scale and volume goes up, the cost of production comes down. Uh, and that's what's happening today in, in the renewable sector. The projects are small, with small land parcels being available. And I think what is important is, and it's, it's being driven by, based on where do we have the best uh, solar availability? Where do you have the best wind velocity to be able to have the best uh, you know, power plants being put? And then people go and try to you know, secure land and all those stuff. The land cost becomes a major, major development cost in those, those places. So the cost of a solar development or wind development is very much dependent on two factors. One, the cost of the technology itself, but second is the cost of land actually. And, and those are factors which needs to be brought in with respect to how some of those developments can be done in a manner where they're done in a very, in a manner where you are able to make best use of everything that you can do on the project site actually. So let's take example. If we talk about uh, existing plant where there is a possibility to add maybe additional solar, what else could be done on that particular facility? And many a times, those assets, because they're not properly connected to the grid, they are outside the utilization of solar in Vietnam, even though the install base is very high. If you just look at the actual generation being consumed, is a very small fraction. And that's happening because sometimes it's not properly connected to the grid. And second is maybe the base load is based still on conventional power generation. So I think this shift in thinking with respect to how can we utilize renewable when it's available and switch to uh, conventional generation or fossil power generation as peak loads rather than the other way around. It's, it's, it's a very important factor to consider. The other element is the system itself. I mean, the grids today are not designed to be able to respond that faster actually. So modernization the grid with respect to being able to understand the load demands and all this thing and being able to respond to that would be an additional element which is there. So I would say in terms of technology, I feel hydrogen has the ability or green ammonia has the ability to be a very good transition fuel. Will it replace gas, coal? I doubt. But it can actually, we don't need to switch off something to switch on something. You know, it can coexist for a longer period of time before we allow it to phase, phase out. And that's what I'm looking at when we can we talk to customers and investors. Don't, we don't need to switch off something. Mm -hmm. okay? possibility yeah. for coexisting, but how yeah. you utilize them, that's what's happening in US today. Most of the gas power plants which are being built, they're being, being built not as base load, they're being built as speakers. There's a whole shift in, in the whole philosophy of how those plants are being built. Indeed, yeah, nothing, yeah. No, thanks for that. Uh, and I think we have to diversify our basket for sure, because if anything, the energy crisis has highlighted to us that we have to have diverse sources of of fuel and other sources of energy, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Isabel, what's and your if I can on? just add one more point, uh, which is very important is, if you look in situations like the Russia-Ukraine war, what remained stable was the renewable energy because the CAPEX was done, the operation cost on those things was still fixed. It did not change much. But all the coal plants, all the gas-fired power plants, they had a huge swing on their gas prices and coal prices. So the cost of operation of all those plants went up. So either the, the power producers or the governments, somebody had to bear that burden, actually. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. Isabel, what's your uh, take on the tariff? And uh, so I don't want to repeat uh, what yeah. Narsim said, because I think that was an excellent presentation. And let me touch upon carbon credits, right? Yeah. I think we, um, as everybody knows, there's something like 2.9 trillion worth of funding that is needed every single year until 2030, if we are actually to limit global warming to the one and a half is degrees centigrade, right? Um, so for that, climate finance will be critical to catalyze necessary investments, but it won't be sufficient. So we believe that carbon markets can actually help. 
And something that I wanted to mention is that we need to look at carbon markets with a bit of a distinctive lens. You know, we have voluntary carbon markets and we have compliance carbon mm -hmm. markets. And I think we can, we need to differentiate the two. I think for the compliance carbon markets, to some extent, I think we're talking about domestic government spending, supporting climate goals. For example, we could talk about a state-owned utility, building a solar facility, or something that DFIs can help catalyze, et cetera, et cetera. But I think the voluntary carbon markets, I think these are commercially oriented investments in climate assets. And this is this is the space where private finance is playing. And, and one example could be an investment in a wind farm or a solar project by the private sector, but where DFIs or say the multilateral investment guarantee agency could come and de-risk the investment. And to some extent, this, you know, as you move away from the voluntary carbon markets, you start touching upon what we call result-based climate finance. Mm -hmm. But the point is, these are both needed. And I think I think we have seen a lot of, I guess, the compliance markets under Article 6 of the Paris Agreement are also expected to develop. Uh, the compliance markets, as, as you may have heard, can result in, in cost savings of up to 300 billion US dollars per year. And, and potentially, it has been estimated that they can actually reduce an additional amount of greenhouse emissions. So we do believe that that this is going to get there, right? I think uh, for sure. So I wanted to mention that. I think on the pricing, I agree with you. I think the the um, um, the the grid parity has been reached. I think certainly for solar in some of the markets. It all depends on the regulation and the legislation in the local market. In some markets, we're still seeing in some ASEAN markets, as we know, significantly higher tariffs, solar tariffs that needed to be, right? Um, but but I do think that uh, we are not yet seeing a green hydrogen competitive in, at competitive prices at, at scale, right? Mm -hmm. We do think that in some markets where there's plentiful of uh, and cheap renewable energy produced, um, uh, we do think that in some markets we're going to see competitive hydrogen by 2030. So uh, let me stop there. Perfect. No, thank you for that. And in fact, uh, I was going to come to Philippines FDI as uh, Under Secretary uh, Guevara had highlighted very, very eloquently the kind of opportunities coming up. Uh, unfortunately, she is leaving quite uh, shortly. So probably, Isabel, you also in your opening talked a lot about Philippines. Uh, and, and given the clarity in the regulatory framework in terms of 100% foreign ownership uh, and the sheer size of opportunity in Philippines, uh, what is uh, your sense of uh, foreign investors' appetite for Philippines as a market, uh, as well as uh, the, the grand plans which are there to have offshore wind and other projects deployed, do, see, do you see a strong interest from both foreign investors as well as lenders? Absolutely, absolutely. I think we have seen, thanks to the, the, the changes, I mean, the heightened activity by the government of the Philippines to accelerate the renewable energy development, we've seen an incredible amount of interest um, with, with very high traffic of, of new uh, missions coming into Philippines, um, both to... Uh, jointly with local partners or even alone. So absolutely, we our appetite is there and the appetite of other lenders is there. I think you, you asked about offshore wind. Yeah. So I think it's widely recognized that the current government has already made some significant and positive st steps that are gonna help offshore wind development in the Philippines. Um, just last week, as he was mentioning the opening speeches, the executive order by the uh, was, was gonna streamline uh, the processing and the leasing fees for the offshore wind projects, um, and this one-stop shop, which is that whole of government approach to implement um, uh, offshore wind, is going to ensure that all government agencies and all bureaus are covered. So I, I have to say the fact that the government is, is allowing all permitting agencies to submit to DOE a complete list of permits with all the fees and procedures envisaged all at once, that really creates a standard list of permits and procedures uh, that, that, that investors really like. So I, for sure, we, we're going to see a lot of interest. We believe that this is, is a very, very positive initiative by the government. Um, I think that, with as with everything else, um, it, it's not going to only enable the potential investors to clarify 
more expeditiously what is required. Uh, but also the fact that the removal of the foreign ownership cap last November for renewable energy projects is also there um, together in combination. This, this is very good news for the, uh, um, for the offshore wind development projects. I think that they are very heavily, uh, very highly capital intensive. Um, there are already several projects in early stages of development, but especially towards the final investment decision, this certainty is going to really accelerate the decision that are not only sponsors take, but we take as lenders. Um, I, I do think that the early stages of this technology in the Philippines, with a combination of the local knowledge and the combination of global experience in offshore wind, it's going to be key in delivering successful projects. What I think the government could do a bit more of um, is the government can continue to build on these steps by providing additional policy clarity, clarity right, with regards to long-term targets, award mechanisms, you know, whatever the government can provide in, that is going to increase clarity and give certainty to the um, quantum and the type of invest investments coming up is going to do nothing else but significantly increase the appetite. So communication, you know, wide communication in terms of potential targets, quantum investments, that's going to go a long way. Um, of course, the government said is, is, is discussing near term targets by 2030 and longer term targets by 2040 and 2050. But if that could actually be publicized, published, provide certainty to investors, that would go a long way. Um, also, we need to think of transmission assets. We need to think of the logistics supply chains and the ports required to bring that equipment in. Um, all of that, if all of that, if, the, if there's going to be massive capacities that are expected across the supply chain for offshore wind to materialize. So the government could identify appropriate grid reinforcements and green stability requirements. And that would help, again, for the offshore, we, offshore wind generation industry to have even more certainty that they're not going to be curtailed, et cetera, et cetera. So overall, we just think it's, it's a huge step in the right direction. And we're looking forward to seeing more and more policy clarity come into the market. Wonderful. I think for clean power, you have given the three C's, right? The clarity, certainty, and communication. Huh? So that is so very uh, appropriate. And I'm sure all the countries in the region will probably uh, go in that same direction, given the huge opportunity there is there. Uh, Nasik, I think coming to you, and I think we have got another five minutes to go. Um, uh, I wanted to have two quick questions for you. One is, how do you see the regional grid evolving? Uh, and what's the importance of that in the energy transition? And second is, as you see a number of opportunities coming for renewable energy in the region, you know, and Philippines uh, just set out the target. We talked about what Indonesia wants to do, what Thailand wants to do. Do you see an ecosystem of technology providers or regional equipment manufacturers to set up shop in Southeast Asia and bring FDI in that respect uh, in this region as well? So let me take the first question. Uh, it's a very, uh, I mean, important questions where, which when you see most of the time, uh, the ministers, when they meet, they talk about it, right? And there has been some progress. There has been some uh, uh, transmission grids being established between Singapore and Laos, Singapore and Malaysia, uh, Thailand and Laos and Cambodia. So it, it's, it's being done, but whether uh, someday we'll be able to see an ASEAN grid, I think the answer is yes, because I, I believe uh, the it all depends on how the geopolitical relationship is. If people keep the uh, keep the uh, politics out, it makes sense to have an uh, ASEAN grid because, you know, if you look at uh, each country has its own strength on certain types of energy sources and how can they leverage that during certain uh, parts of the parts of the year, I, I think it, it makes all sense. But it is less of a technical, uh, technical yeah. reason, more of a political reason. So there is a lot of political willpower required here. But I'm optimistic because I'm seeing uh, slowly governments talking to each other and finding some ways of connecting at least with one country to the other, not if not the whole ASEAN grid together. Yeah. So hopefully it, it happens someday. But it will, if it happens, it actually brings a lot of stability on the grid uh, by using renewable power and everything else because there's a lot of hydro and all those stuff. Some countries are blessed and actually brings a lot of stability that is needed. On the second question with respect to 
how renewable energy could bring more manufacturing, more uh, economic growth in terms of you know job creation and, and everything else. I don't think it can be done, and this is my personal view, I don't think it can be done based on being able to meet the need of one country alone. So for instance, if we look at the countries uh, which require certain local content and all the stuff, but imagine, I mean, if somebody's setting up a battery manufacturing plant or a solar panel manufacturing plant, they need the scale and volume to be able to compete globally. So while it might be able to get some blessing from the governments, uh, you know, being able to keep the local content mandatory and being able to survive for some time, but they need to be competitive and be able to compete with the big players in the market, whether they're coming from China or any other country. So that's my take. Uh, but of course, I mean, there is room uh, because we have seen the capacity is becoming uh, whatever manufacturing capacity is there, that's not sufficient. So the first mover advantage is there, but any investment which is needed should not be done by just keeping, uh, you know, uh, hey, I, I need to meet the local content and that's an opportunity, it's a short-term opportunity. They need to build it, considering that they will be able to build it for being a global supply chain, as Isabel was mentioning, because there is enough demand in the market. The market is going to explode. So whosoever makes that will definitely make money, but they need to be really competitive and efficient uh, to be able to compete with the best in the world. Indeed, yeah, no, thanks for that. And I think uh, if, if Southeast Asia has to become part of the global supply chain in the renewable energy space, then probably next five to seven years offers the best opportunity, right? And if yeah. you can get the right technology partnerships, the right financing and right economic uh, regulatory environment, uh, it, it would be good. Okay, we are about to come to the hour and uh, perhaps a last uh, parting statements from you. Isabel, what are you excited about in the next 12 months? Oh, wow, my goodness, um, a lot of things. I'm excited about the interface between infratech and traditional um, infrastructure assets. I think that that space is giving us a lot of food for thought. Um, and I'm hoping that three or four countries within the Asia region are gonna be front runners in inf deployment of infratech or infra technology. Um, that it's keeping me super excited. Um, second, um, honestly, I'm quite excited about the increase, um, the hybrids that I'm seeing uh, with batteries. Um, uh, I, and I think that that, you know, they were very unusual a few years back now is more the norm. Than the exception to mm -hmm. so I'm really pleased and those rules of thumbs that were circulating out there two hour battery three whatever you know the percentages I'm so glad that we are have moved past that and we're actually having the ability and the technical understanding as to how to size the, the battery and how to uh, understand what will be the right cost you know co uh, cost and benefit ratio so that keeps me excited and third um Honestly speaking, these technologies that we discussed today, right? I'm extremely excited about green hydrogen, green ammonia, um, a, you know, all sorts of batteries, you know, sustainable mining of the critical minerals. So all of that, it's keeping me quite excited these days. Wonderful. Thank you, Thank Sharad. you for that. Thank you, Nassim. What's what? What is your passion for the next 12 months? You know, as I said, uh, energy transition is is an opportunity to. Uh, make big changes. I have never seen the, the, uh, the call for energy transition in, in the manner where it is today. So being part of that you know, whole uh, small role that we can play uh, as an individual keeps me really excited. Uh, I think I, you know, working with Black & Beach, uh, uh, a company which also believes in the energy transition, we gave up a significant amount of volume of our business it, it speaks very highly about the company. So being able to you know, take those things, being the first to be able to develop the, uh, the world's biggest green hydrogen facility, I think those are things that excites me. Uh, being here in the region in, in Asia Pacific, uh, I always tell our customers, I tell them, don't be a follower. When can we be the leader? I mean, we don't need to always look at the West and, and see that you know, the West has developed and then Asia uh, as a region is always a follower five years, 10 years behind the line. It's time, at least on the energy transition, to lead on certain things. So that keeps me excited. We have, a, we have, we have governments now listening. We have a lot of talented resources here and it's great to work with, so. 
Indeed. No, thank you. I think this is a confluence of a great number of things coming together, isn't it? The digitalization, the technology, the probably the policies coming together. And, and yeah, indeed, our region could make that quantum leap and, and meet our targets of renewable energy and hopefully a net zero world uh, in near future. I think uh, on the note of a strong partnership, probably which is required between private sector, uh, foreign developers bringing in FDI, uh, local uh, government doing the right things in terms of policy, and of course, multilaterals uh, and financiers acting a very, very, uh, playing a very important role would be critical. So with that, thank you so much. I think there's some questions on the chat, uh, which which uh, we can respond to and the slides will be made available, I suppose, Ryan. So thank you for that. And thank you, Nursing. Thank you, Isabel. It was great having you here. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Shas. Thank you, Isabel. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nurse. Thank you, Ms. Shah. Thank you, Ms. Isabel. And thank you, Mr. Mr. Nassan, thank you for your powerful and really useful panel discussion. And let me thank all the speakers. The impressive and powerful presentation shows the energy transformation and the vitality and the ambition of the all the ASEAN countries. Again, we are really very confident that the ASEAN region will be the one of the fastest growing clean energy region in the world. So please let me introduce again. So the webinar was had in a connection with the ASEAN Clean Energy Week. The event that has been held in the Philippines for the seven years. The ASEAN Clean Energy Week will be started at 21 to 22 November 2023. The venue is in SMX Ara Malena. So, uh, and also we bring together over 5,000 more attendees, energy professionals, leaders, and decision makers. We are excited to explore how we can accelerate the energy transition in the Dominic region, which is the home of the some world's fattest growing economics. This is a perfect opportunity to share the insights and exchange ideas on the key areas, including the solar energy, wind energy, and energy storage. So thank you again. Thank you all the audience and speakers for the today. See you next, the Impact Webinar. Thank you. Thank you all. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you.